So welcome, so welcome to this, this uh, symposium, uh, symposium uh, at, uh, the, uh, at the Society of Antiquaries. Um, uh, and uh, uh, today we are marking the 30th anniversary of the destruction of Starry Moss, the old bridge in Mostar, on 9th November, so the very day that it was destroyed 30 years ago, which was a seminal moment in the uh, intentional destruction of cultural property. Before, before the attack, the attack on Palmyra, Palmyra before, before the destruction, destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas by the Taliban, in the deliberate destruction of cultural of, heritage of the 1992-1995 Bosnian War, War, which was the greatest destruction of cultural heritage, heritage in Europe, Europe since World War II, War II. And, far and far more, more than, than any other structure, the Starry Mosque became, the destruction of the Starry Mosque became emblematic of those attacks on cultural heritage. Just trying to find the next slide. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so the attack oh, was on the old bridge was a war crime that went on to be prosecuted at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the commonly known as the ICTY. And Luke Moffat will be considering the tangled history of that prosecution after me. Once the war was over, the bridge was rebuilt through an international effort, the new old bridge. And the post-conflict restoration of the bridge has, uh, however, raised questions of authenticity that Rob Be Bevan will be considering. And it, it, it challenged ideas of peace building and reconciliation that those behind the Greek building of the bridge hope to bring about. And we'll see, th this, was this true? Now, should the Starry Mosque have been rebuilt as a replica of the original? Saida Hasanagic will be offering her observations on what people thought at the time and since then, lo local people and international visitors. And after lunch, we'll end with a, a be followed by Nerma Cridge looking at another uh, significant uh, site of Mostar's heritage, the Partisan Cemetery. Uh, that was a, that has been vandalized and neglected, unlike the old bridge area. Now, the Starry Mosque, just a few, uh, just a bit of background. It was an engineering miracle built on the orders of the Ottoman uh, ruler Suleiman the Magnificent, designed by the ruler's chief architect Hayruddin, and completed in a uh, 1566, 57, 67. And these are just a few views of the old uh, bridge from the, the, the first half of the 20th century, going back actually to 1913. Uh, a picture by Sidney Carline, British artist uh, from 1919. And down in the bottom right, uh, it was a picture from the 1920s. So it was, it was a, a source of inspiration. Now, um, the um, 
dating the structure, what was the Starry Moss? Now, Peter Koenigholm, uh, who's a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, kindly, but based in the States, kindly sent me this diagram. He analyzed the wood uh, elements uh, that were sent to him from archaeological uh, excavations before the bridge was rebuilt. And he found evidence of structures going back as far of as uh, one, uh, 1042. Uh, so there was obviously some kind of crossing and the old bridge replaced that. Uh, the What we call the old bridge replaced these earlier structures. But as you can see, this the bridge has been uh, an iconic structure that is referenced in many ways. And just these are just all these different titles of books that use all on different subjects that um, use the, the bridge to uh, to um, illustrate their covers. Now, just a bit of history. Now, Bo Bosnia was obviously it was part of the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic world for over four hundred years. Then. It, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then part of the of Yugoslavia from 1918 until 1992. And from 1945, uh, it was uh, 1992. It was one of a republic, six republics in the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, until it declared independence on in 1992 on 3rd March. It was a UN member state from 22nd, 92, so, so, because some people think, oh, like, oh, well, it was Yugoslavia, nobody cared, but it was a member state of the UN from May 1992 and a UN UNESCO member state from the 2nd of June 1993. Now, just some background in the Bosnian War it was driven by ideologies of ethnic exclusivism, where ethnic religious groups left sec separately. Uh, it targeted the other, so targeting different ethno-religious groups. It targeted evidence of a diverse heritage, and it targeted a, a pan-Bosnian identity. And this is just some of the effects of ethnic cleansing. Uh, so, you know, the paramilitaries from Serbia and Montenegro, expulsions, and then after the war, we have the mass graves and exhumations, which they're still going on today. And there was a destruction of pluralism. This shows, uh, it shows uh, uh, the, the town of Bozanska Krupa, where, uh, where there was a, a Catholic church, um, an Orthodox church, and a, and a mosque within standing within meters of each other. And the Catholic church, as you see, was destroyed, the town mosque was destroyed, but the because it was held by the Bosnian Serbs, uh, the Orthodox Church was unchurched. And here's just some other uh, examples. It was, you know, the Mostar was just one of a countrywide destruction of cultural property. And there was Amici, where it's site of a massacre and destruction of mosque uh, down in the left, left hand. That is the local imams, standing in front of what had been a mosque, and in the large picture were the remains of a historic mosque that um, I found with a colleague in in the woods uh, on high on the banks of the Dreamer. And the woods had grown up since the war. There was young trees. So this is, oh, heritage seems to have dis disappeared from this slide, but it was <laughs> intentional targeting of cultural heritage. And here's all pictures of the Starry Moss. So you see it before when it was being attacked on the top end, the, the, the actual screenshot of the video of its destruction or attack on it and what it looked like after the bridge was brought down. Now, sorry, I'm losing my place. <laughs> But one of the strange things, so the so basically the war started when with um, separatist Bosnian Serbs, assisted by the Yugoslav People's Army, the JNA, had uh, and Serbian and Montenegrin paramilitaries, as I showed you earlier, had moved to agree aggressively to claim territory from Bosnia as the governor's declaration of independence, and at this stage of the conflict. Bosnian government forces were fighting in alliance with Bosnian Croat forces, the HVO, 
which means in Croatian, Croatian Defense Council. And a bizarre outcome of that alliance was the exhibition Herbicide Mostar 92, which was on the destruction of Mostar's cultural heritage by the Bosnian Serb and JNA forces. And the exhibition and this catalog cover, which you can see, uh, was funded by the HVO, who went on to destroy the, 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 and the, with the old bridge on the cover. And they went on, of course, to destroy the old bridge uh, in 1993. And it was after the, the uh, announcement of the Vance own plan in January 1993 that proposed to, di to divide uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina into mono-ethnic cantons that um, uh, Bosnian Croat forces, the HVO, and their leadership, political, they had political leadership, turned on their former Bosnian government allies to, in attempt to gain territory for an ethnically pure a Croat para state of Herzeg Bosna with Mostar as its capital, and it would have a purely Catholic religious identity. So here again, there was ethnic cleansing of Bosnian Muslim populations. The Serb population had mainly left by then, and it was accompanied by the wide scale devastation of Ottoman and Islamic religious and cultural heritage, as well as that of what is, was perceived as Orthodox as Serb. Uh, so this what is called the Croat Muslim War was epitomized by the deliberate assaults by the HVO and the historic core of Mostar. They lay principally in the Bosnian government held east bank of the Neretva during a siege that began uh, in, in May 1993. And of course, the zenith of this devastation was the premeditated shelling of the Starry Mosque, the old bridge, until it collapsed into the Neretva on the 9th of November 1993, so just about now, 30 years ago. So the the conf, this conflict uh, did end with the signing of the Washington Agreement in March 1994, and an EU administration were, moved in to manage the divided city. So as I say, Mostar was a ruined city. It was the most extensively ravaged of, of Bosnia's historic uh, cities and towns. Uh, during the earlier JNA Bosnian Serb army attacks, uh, mosques, Catholic churches, cultural institutions, and other infrastructure uh, was targeted. Uh, some reduced to a sequence of ruins, like you can see of this on the left of the bazaar buildings in Kuyunjiluk. Uh, and all the bridges, with the exception of the old bridge, was were destroyed by the JNA and Bosnian Serb army forces. However, they withdrew, and uh, and from May nineteen ninety three, as I said, uh, separatist Bosnian Croat forces began to lay siege to Mostar, and the city's Ottoman and Islamic heritage was their principal target. A report by the European Community Monitoring Mission uh, from June 1993 wrote that uh, how old Mostar's old town was beginning to resemble Beirut and that all Muslim monuments were being intentionally and systematically destroyed, most infamously the old bridge of the Starry Mosque. The bridge had been targeted from the beginning of the conflict, though it was noted that while it had been struck by the JNA's two and a half month siege of Mostar, it was hit many more times during the HVO siege beginning in nine, May 93. So as I said, Bosnia was a UN member state. It was a UNESCO member state. And in July 1993, the Bosnian government was so alarmed about the state of the old bridge, it sent a letter, an urgent letter to the UN Security Council, UNESCO, and the Council of Europe, asking that they prevent the destruction of the old bridge and immediately send a UNESCO team. Well, the letter received no reply, and obviously no UNESCO team popped up in the vicinity. Uh, three days later, on 12th of July, 1993, the state of 
Bosnia-Herzegovina acceded to all UNESCO conventions, uh, including the, for protecting cultural property, including the 1954 Hague Convention for the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict. But still no help came. Then on the 8th of November, 1992, Three, an HVO tank began a sustained shelling of the bridge. The mayor of East Mostar made a desperate attempt to, uh, uh, over the radio to uh, get the international community to get them to condemn the attack and calling for assistance. But the assault went on. And at approximately 10.15 on the morning of November uh, 1993, the bridge crumbled into the Neretva. Now the shelling and the uh, the was filmed by several Bosnian cameramen, uh, Enes Dalalic, Elin Palata, and Nedjad Kadsumovic. But it was a, a British Scottish ex soldier who was working for an independent uh, television, British tele television production company, who also filmed it. And it was his footage that got out first and was made widely accessible to the international media. And uh, it, so these images of the bridge tumbling into the river with celebratory, what's been described as celebratory gunfire from the Croat side was viewed around the world. And though the uh, involvement of the Croatian army, not, not the Bosnian Croats, but the Croatian army from Croatia was suspected at the time and was always denied by the Croatian authorities we will see later, uh, it's now been confirmed that this was actually a case and they were actively participating in the destruction of the bridge. So there was obviously huge reaction to this. And it's perhaps not so surprising that Serbian state uh, television and uh, uh, would screen extensive, dis extensive coverage of the destruction of the bridge. And it seemed to, uh, to outside observers that the destruction of this iconic monument uh, appeared to reunite briefly, if anything, the warring parties in the, the Bosnian conflict. And reports described how people of all nationalities burst into tears when they heard the news. So uh, one of the Bel one of the footage, uh, coverage in the Belgrade included a, a Belgrade student who said, I felt sick when I saw the pictures. No one has the right to destroy our hit history. And Bogdan Bogdanovic, the architect who designed the Partisan Cemetery and many other of the uh, World War II monuments that appeared in the 1960s, uh, said the bridge was like a heavenly arch and lamented it as, as if one of my closest relatives has, has died. So this was the feeling towards the destruction of the bridge. An appeal from Serbian professional heritage and museum bodies uh, called for a stop to the destruction of cultural heritage in Bosnia-Herzegovina, citing the, uh, the collapse of the old bridge as the culmination of, of that destruction. In Croatia, official re reaction oscillated uneasily, though generally shock was, was uh, expressed. Veteran Bosnian journal journalist Kemal Kurspahic uh, uh, wrote about what he called the quotes, uh, the bridge simply fell type of reporting of the destruction in the mainstream Croatian media, where the final dis collapse was described in the uh, pro government daily Vjesnik as the result, as simply as the result of an artillery battles between uh, Bosnian Muslim, that is, they call the Muslim government forces and the HVO rather than because it was deliberately targeted. Yet the day after the collapse of the bridge, Vjesnik wrote an editorial uh, demanding that those responsible be for the destruction be identified. Um, and why it was no surprise that there were elegies for the old bridge and the independent media in Croatia it was more unexpected that Bosnian journalist Carol J. Williams was able to find a Croatian government official willing to condemn the destruction as a tragic loss for everyone, not just the Muslims, but for the Croats who live there, mainly it seemed because they might think that the Croatians had done it, which they had. So the Society of Croatian Art Historians also issued a, pro, uh, a protest and uh, whatever Croatian president uh, Franjo Tudjman's private thoughts were publicly 
he expressed regret about the destruction of the bridge and hoped the perpetrators would be brought to justice, all the while categorically denying the involvement of Croatia or the Croatian army. And a commission of Croatian experts to reconstruct the bridge was even established at the request of Jarko Domjan, vice president of the Croatian parliament. Yet, yet despite all this attention to the destruction, when it came to actually providing assistance, international heritage protection uh, bodies felt prey to negative reactions from public opinion, the media and politicians. And when the television screens were showing day, night after night, the suffering of Bosnia's people. Um, so the global condemnation, some of the rea other reactions uh, were seen by some as emotional outcries, displaying allegedly disturbing signs of indifference to human suffering. And one Belgrade-based uh, European diplomat observed that while recall, recalled a similar outpouring after the JNA shelling of Dubrovnik in 1991 and, and said the, the Mostar bombing has sparked another round of debate over whether the world is more interested in preserving stones or people. And I'm sure you all know this still goes on. And so four months after the bridge was destroyed, the Bosnia authorities wrote, sent another letter to the same international bodies, uh, reminding them of their, it had written to before the bridge was destroyed, reminding of their lack of action. But in, in the court of Bosnian opinion, it was uh, uh, UNESCO that bore the brunt, and there was this cartoon that uh, appeared in the uh, Sarajevo daily Oslobodzenia, showing UNESCO uh, collapsing along with the old bridge. So it was clear that the uh, international legal instruments for protecting cultural heritage in times of conflict were completely ineffective. The old bridge was destroyed at the end of 1993, so that was more than a year after the war had begun. Yet the international community seemed unable to prevent such acts happening, despite the presence of UN peacekeeping troops and humanitarian aid organizations across the country. So, we, so there was obviously, for many reasons, uh, combined with an unwilling support to provide emergency assistance to protect cultural heritage while the conflict was ongoing on the grounds that it might get attacked again. And we again, we, we hear this again. There was very little assistance to protect Bosnia-Herzegovina's cultural heritage during the war. But what of the Islamic states, which might have been expected to help, and the... Uh, the foreign ministers of the organization of the Islamic Conference, the OIC, strongly condemned the destruction of Bosnia's Herzegovina's cities and heritage. And its Istanbul-based cultural arm, Irsaka, had already established a research program on the history and culture of Bosnia-Herzegovina to raise awareness of the extent of the destruction of that country's heritage. And almost a year uh, later, the uh, OIC foreign ministers uh, directed Irsika to uh, create a fund to assess the damage to the heritage uh, in Bosnia and to create a fund to facilitate restoration of these monuments, um, though that never really happened until after the war was over. But Irsika's contribution mostly was driven by this man, our um, architect Amir Pasic. Uh, called Mostar 2004. He'd won an Aga Khan Award in 1986 for the conservation of Mostar's Obtan. And under his aegis, a series of workshops were held between 1994 and 2004 that aimed at formulating a rest plan, restoration plan uh, for the reconstruction of the ravaged city. Just trying to see what I've got next. <laughs> okay. So I don't really have, you will see in the film something about the criminal and his crime. And this was us. Uh, so who was 
responsible for the destruction. Well, eventually, the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia charged, uh, there was a perlich et al., which Luke will be talking about later, um, but uh, which had six defendants, one of whom was Slobodan Praljak. The HVO commander held principally a counter for the death destruction of the bridge. And he was famously said to have remarked that he was prepared to destroy hundreds of old bridges for the sake of one of my soldiers' little fingers. And he maintained that according to international law, it hadn't been a war crime to demolish the bridge. Uh, on one occasion asserting it was because it should have been marked with the UNESCO emblem of the 1954 Hague Convention. Uh, and on another occasion, it, he declared it was a legitimate military target because the Bosnian army used the bridge to move men and supplies uh, to a government-held enclave on the west bank of the Neretva. And while he was waiting for uh, a war crimes indictment, uh, he bullishly predicted no one would be charged for the destruction of the old bridge, saying it had been a military facility and in a war, a military facility could be demolished regardless of its cultural value. Value, And uh, afterwards, shortly, he was indicted by the Archbishop, as we said, and the destruction of the bridge was one of the many war crimes with which uh, this group of uh, leaders were indicted. So Luke will tell you a lot more about that. But during the trial, he denied any responsibility. Pralyak decided to any responsibility whatsoever for the destruction of the old bridge, accusing the Muslims, like the Bosnian government, of destroying the bridge themselves, claiming that the Bosnian army had set explosives to bring the structure down. So there was blaming the victim for the crime. So he worked strenuously to prove the scenario, writing a book about it, uh, had a website, setting out his case, and um, analysis of the video footage of the collapse by experts, and nevertheless, in May 2013, Praljak and his co-defendants were found guilty of participating in a joint criminal enterprise uh, with the destruction of the old bridge, specifically addressed in the trial chamber's judgment. Yet, the judgment was to be controversially overturned by the ICTY Appeal Court in 2017, and, and Luke will be going on about that. And this was very overshadowed. A lot of people didn't notice it, this judgment, because of the in-court suicide, uh, suicide of, of uh, Slobodan Pralyak. And uh, it was also the last case held by the ICTY. So after the war ended, The Dayton Peace Agreement, 1995, focused on reversing the effects of ethnic cleansing, and it recognized the role that cultural heritage had played in the conflict, destruction of cultural heritage played in the conflict. And one of the uh, uh, the Treaty's 11 annexes, Annex 8, uh, mandated the establishment of a commission to preserve national monuments, which remains still the only statewide heritage institution in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So we can argue that the restoration and preservation of, of the destroyed and damaged historic monuments of Bosnia-Herzegovina should have taken place within the framework of the Dayton Agreement, which focused on the return of refugees and displaced people to the homes and communities from which they'd been forcibly expelled. Yet, with few exceptions, the international community's involvement in post-conflict Bosnia-Herzegovina in the decade after the war in heritage restoration could be characterized by a very narrow focus on a small number of high profile projects, chief among them, which was the reconstruction of the Starry Most and the, its surrounding environment. And this was a World Bank led UNESCO coordinated project. So the old bridge came to be mobilized as a symbol that embodied the ideas of reconciliation and the destruction, reconstruction of relations between Bosnia Herzegovina's national national groups that the international community was keen to promote in the aftermath of the war, and a significant amount of the international funding available for his his heritage restoration was swallowed up by the projects in Mostar. 
So there was a, there was a, a quite a, a battle, a, and stakes were high in this battle for funding uh, such rec reconstruction or restoration of what were considered non-essential historic monuments, uh, which of course many of them mean were religious structures, and the Bosnian authorities and UNESCO drew up lists of historic buildings requiring restoration, um, but they certainly weren't a priority for most of those in involved in restoration. Uh, and furthermore, non-Islamic or non-denominational donors saw involvement of the reconstruction of religious structures as problematic, so as because they were seen as so tied to ethno-national identity and it felt they felt it left them open to charges of favoring one of the parties in the conflict over the others. Though, of course, the reason these structures had been attacked was precisely because of their ethnic uh, national affiliation. Um, this could even apply to uh, a secular building like the National Library in Saria with a former town hall. And it, it was suggested that as a as a, the library was a symbol of Serb aggression, restoration of the ruined library might be prepared, perceived as a hostile act by the Bosnian Serbs if no restoration of an equivalent important Serb historic monument took place. And of course, difficult to find such such a place. So the there were definitely restoration stakes for a major input by international donors. There were two front runners. One was a library, but they were too problematic, too many problems arose. And uh, so the other one was the old bridge. Uh, so, and of course, both these structures were located in cities where the international community and the international media had the most significant uh, presence. And that's quite important because there were important monuments or even small towns like uh, Focha with the Alaja Mosque, which had been obliterated, the Muslim heritage and Islamic heritage had been obliterated, but uh, this was far from the gaze of the international media, whereas the destruction of the old bridge and the Vietnicha had been public events, very public events, observed on television screens. Um, and this definitely had a, an impact in choosing what was to reconstruct. And the Starry Mosque was already an international icon. Uh, it was easily accessible from Dubrovnik and the resorts of the Dalmatian coast. Many Europeans from other parts of Europe had, you know, many had, had driven down towards Dubrovnik and stopped off uh, in, in uh, Mostar. So even though it seemed inconceivable that the National Library wouldn't uh, be restored, in fact, it was... Um, you know, there had been UNESCO resolutions causing, calling for it to be restored, lots of initiatives, and, uh, but, and this, you know, equivalent, uh, uh, making it equivalent with a Nazi book burning, so, but that didn't happen. Uh, there were too many controversies associated, and international donors took fright. So the Starry Moss became the front runner in the race uh, of, this race to put uh, to to be the the big where the big money went and that was the, the re reconstruction of the bridge. So this World Bank came behind and he one World Bank official said uh, interestingly. The Mostar Bridge is really the symbol of all Bosnia. Donors could have chosen the library. The National Library, and they thought about it and decided and thought they didn't want to get involved and decided the bridge was a better object for symbolic value. If you're going to do just that one thing, you have to choose one thing. So they chose the bridge. And it, they also observed the World Bank at that while other sites had merits, none conveyed as much symbolism as the old bridge. The the old the Starry Moss was able to order offer symbolic value on many fronts, multiculturalism, cultural diversity, reconciliation, peaceful coexistence, and religious toleration, all through the process of material process that could be watched of bridge building. Uh, and here I've just showed some of in 1997, it was quite a it took a while for to get the World Bank on board and one important event was, uh, which you can see, 
yes, on screen now, is uh, in 1997, Hungarian escort troops raised uh, the stones of the destroyed bridge from the river Neretva, and that attracted a huge crowd. And that's just some of the crossings that were built uh, uh, over the bridge once it was destroyed. So the reconstruction of the Osteri Most um, offered an obvious symbol for the story of the international community wished to tell about reconnecting communities. And the city Serbs, who'd formed almost 19% of Mostar's population in 90, um, 1991, and who had almost fled almost entirely in 1992, were left out of this pairing. Um, it was also where the idea of reconstruction of cultural heritage playing an active role in the uh, process of reconciliation uh, between formerly warring ethno-national groups came actively into play. And uh, this was the kind of, it, and the UNESCO's preliminary discussions with the World Bank um, had been keen to ensure a reconciled approach to reconstruction, whatever that means. Uh, it, and the bridge was characterized as a symbol of peace and reconciliation. So uh, here we see some of the, some of the, uh, I mean, what, what's incredible is the, how the old bridge was actually constructed in the first place. When you see how complicate, complex the reconstruction was. And of course this was in, the 16th century. So it's still an enigma. No one really knows how it was constructed. And as you can see, this, this but the, the main contractors are actually Turkish. Um, some of these workers are Turkish workers. Uh, so, but he had, but uh, the, the bridge had been fortunate having uh, two uh, passionate and indefatigable ambassadors, that Amir Pashic, who we saw earlier, and Safat Arucevic, uh, East Mostar's mayor from 1994 to 2001. And uh, so there was a long ongoing, you know, negotiations for the bridge to be restored. And uh, Turkey offered to foot the bill, uh, but uh, Safat Arucevic wanted to have Serbs, Muslims, and Croats as involved as well as international actors. So uh, this, this Most and Mostar 2004 workshops went on, and that was also interesting because it gave uh, uh, this kind of informed international uh, network of people who'd been to Istanbul, heard Amir Peshech, heard about the bridge in Mostar, and they were actually ambassadors for uh, supporting this reconstruction all over the world and uh, many in the United States. And a lot of the, the uh, organizations that eventually became involved in the reconstruction of the bridge and the surrounding area um, were, were attended these Mostar 2004 workshops. So, the Mostar Bridge was reborn, um, and six years later, on 23rd July 2004, before an audience of international dignitaries, it, the new old bridge, as many call it, um, opened to worldwide publicity. And in July 2005, the old bridge and the surroundings became Bosnia-Herzegovina's first UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, but this is what they like. Oops. Oop, on the wrong way here. The show. Uh, I think this sign is regularly uh, repainted and updated. But, uh, and uh, I don't know if there's, are there any questions? I think because there's also, uh, I've got, um, there's a film. Should I do it? Should I do it or should you? <laughs> And uh, I thought we could finish with a film of, first it's showing the, uh, it will show the, um, it's from this fantastic web website, if you don't know it, it's worth looking at. It's for, uh, 
of uh, called Targeting History and Memory. And it's a short clip about the war crimes trial and with also clips of the destruction of the bridge and uh, followed by this new footage that's emerged of the Croatian army actually, even though it was denied for many years, well, during the war even, uh, that they had in part, but there uh, is showing them and uh, Saida, who will be speaking later, kindly translated what they're saying, mostly football jargon, but there's a lot of racial slurs and uh, yes, go, go, another one, then it'll come down. So, so you'll see all that. Now, I don't know. Am I supposed to go first? It would have been late July or early August of 1993, I think early August of 93. Uh, the UNHCR spokesman, who was called Peter Kessler, talked about, for the first time, talked about the situation on the east side of Mostar. I think he said 25,000 people approximately there, very little food, very little water, uh, under siege, surrounded. So as a reporter... I immediately thought, well, I want to go down that road and get to Mostar to try to find out what's going on there because it was a, a new, newish uh, theatre of war. And so it was, was clearly going to be an important story. The river Neretva cuts Mostar in two. These wrecked buildings are on the east bank, the stronghold of the Muslim-led Bosnian government forces but they have an important foothold on the otherwise quiet controlled West Bank as well. To get there, you have to cross the old bridge, which was built in the 1500s. It's been hit many times, but it's still standing, just about. On November 9th, 1993, the Herzog Bosnia HBO forces destroyed the Starry Most, or the old bridge in Mostar a truly world-class historical site that was a victim of this, another victim of this war. Poštovani sude, draga gospodo, stari most je uništen 8.11. A pao je 9.11. U 10.15. Gađani u intervalima od dva sata, od osam, u deset, oko iza podne i negde između tri i četiri posle podne. Granate su ga toliko očetile, jednostavno, kad granata pogodi stari most, digne se velika pečurka. To sam prvi put u životu vidio, jes lijepo vidite, ali je žalostno, pošto su ljudi neki plakali. Tenk je rušio most, njega sam dobro, dobro zapamtio. U jednom momentu sam to primijetio, tada sam uzeo kameru, vidio i vatru čak iz tenka, to sam približio, snimio i ostavio sebi kao dokazni materijal. Eto. Suta devetog ujicu, ja sam se nalazio u hotelu Ruža, gospoda to dobro zna, oko deset sat, tenk je ponovo upalio pegranač. 
Na šestu granatu most je pao. Pošto smo mi bili u hotelu Ruža, to vam je 150 metara od starog mosta, veliki talas je se digo i prašenje. Gospoda koja se to gledala suma su počeli rafalati feštat, veseli se. Šta je ovo sad? Puca se, puca se. Kad vidim lica, čak su neki plakali. Šta je pao most? Pa nije moguće, ma jeste. Ja kažem, ja sam baš snimao juče taj tank koji je rušio most i eto vidite, bio sam siguran da će biti srušen. I tako se ide. I personally saw a lot of people on both the east and the west side being very upset when the bridge was finally destroyed and blown up. Ljudi koji nisu videli kako izgleda panika žena, djeca i staraca, narstvo koji su izbili, izbili se došli u malu, mi smo dva dana smiri, smirivali tu paniku. Zaplin Moster West, it was a great deal of shock, regret and shame about the destruction of the old bridge. To je bilo, ne dao Bog da se ponovi više ikad. Pravo je čudo kako sam ijaš bih gostu. Neka mi dođe da bi volio da nisam, jer sam izgubio sve ono što sam volio. Ja, nažalost... Ne mogu reći tko je to srušio, ja znam samo pouzdano jedno, da HVO ni jedan član po nikakvoj zapovjedi nije srušio stari most. Tko je eventualno 8.11.1993. godine gađao iz tenka stari most, što je vidljivo na slikama koje su vidjeli, ja ni danas ne znam. This is a signed and stamped report issued by Milenko Lasic, the HVO district commander, on the 8th of November 1993. He says, from 8.10 in the morning, our tank was opening fire from Stotina during the whole day, and it fired 50 projectiles on Stary Grad. <laughs> I on izjavljuje da je puca. Upravo rušenje tog mosta koji ništa nije značio u strateškom smislu, a opravdavano je da je iz strateških razloga rušen. Ja imam osjećaj da je trebalo, da je politika bila ta koja je htjela srušiti sve mostove između naroda u Bosni i Hercegovini. Što više ih zavaditi i što prije ih razdvojiti. But one thing that should be pointed out is that the war has tended to ethnicize cultural heritage, which in fact was not ethnicized in the past. I, perhaps the people who destroyed the old bridge at Mostar thought they were destroying Muslim cultural heritage, but in fact the old bridge was something that was held in common by Serbs, Croats and Muslims, and this must be kept in mind when considering all types of heritage, including things which are now considered only to be sacral objects of one faith. They were often, in fact, objects that were shared. So this is the clip showing uh, the Croatian army. Those are Croatian army soldiers and they're spotting for the tank, the HVO tanks. And there's lots of racial slurs and uh, congratulations to the HVO. 
of the, his has recently surfaced that someone sold it, but they kept it. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. So, but for what? So, your small father, your young Lucy father. This, this clip will show again uh, destruction, but it's more focused on the reconstruction and the reopening, just a brief uh, film about that. Uh, so now Luke uh, Moffat, Professor Luke Mar Moffat, is going to tell us more about this uh, tangled um, prosecution at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Hi, everybody. Um, Thank you for the invitation today to speak um, and for how um, and organizing uh, the event. I'm going to speak about the law stuff. Um, hopefully, it'll not bore you too much. I think fundamentally, uh, Helen has touched on parts of this already that this was a very difficult and long case. Um, it ultimately resulted in nobody being prosecuted for the destruction of this crime, or at least nobody being convicted as a result of the prosecution. Um, and this really stems from sort of the problems with international law and how we protect cultural property in war, in the sense that we've got two main areas um, that sort of govern this area, international heritage law, which you're probably all familiar with, um, as well as international humanitarian law, so the law of armed conflict and how hostilities are supposed to be conducted. Um, with contemporary conflicts at the moment, this is um, continues to be a, a source of concern whereby a lot of human suffering and physical destruction can be justified under international humanitarian law. And it sort of guides the way in which then international heritage law is interpreted and practiced. 
And really sort of the starting point for both these laws is the 1907 Hague regulations. And it's over 100 years old and also stems from a lot of uh, regulations that were developed by states in Europe and America in the 1800s. And really those laws were trying to limit the effects of bombardment, that when you were carrying out sieges, when you were attacking the enemy in the city, that respect should be given to limit the harm suffered by historical buildings, buildings of uh, religious or educational purpose. However, there was limits to the law that where these objects had become used by the military, we call it military object, then they lost its protection. So it was, it was protection in general, and then the exception to attack in situations where it started being used by the enemy. Um, and so the Hague Conventions uh, in 1954 speak about this in more detail um, and give a whole uh, different levels of protection. Um, and in 1977, uh, the additional protocols also adopt the language that's used in the 1954 Hague Convention. The Geneva Conventions in 1949 don't mention cultural property at all. Um, and it's because the 1907 Hague regulations still applied. Um, and it's a bit of a division in the international attorney law between Hague laws and Geneva laws. But effectively, the Hague laws are about regulating the way in which weapons are used, the means and methods. And this has implications then for how we hold people to account. So at the ICTY, the language that's adopted in developing the war crimes, because we don't have in the 1990s any codified, so we don't have like an international statute that sets out what war crimes are. That doesn't come about until the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court is created in 1998. So the Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia was basing its laws on what was generally accepted by states, so customary law. And one of those is the 1907 Hague Regulations, and also the 1954 Hague Convention. And so there we've got quite antiquated language in the sense that destruction and bombardment of cities is going to be a war crime where there's wanton destruction, um, which isn't justified in military necessity. And then also another um, crime of trying to prevent destruction or damage to educational, religious, historical uh, buildings. And monuments. Um, the difficulty here is that there's no specific protection for cultural property. Um, and it reflects this sort of a, a problem of us as lawyers is we always try to provide more law to cover everything. And so with the ICTY, we had very limited tools in order to protect the Starry Most. So it didn't fall exactly within either of these crimes explicitly. But what we'll see with the Perlis case is that it actually splits between these two crimes um, and uh, Petrovic has wrote a very good article in 2017 about how these crimes aren't always best characterized when they're prosecuted. It reflects both the confusion of lawyers and um, both judges and prosecution in trying to prosecute these sort of crimes. Um, and something which often comes up um, is that the ICW had to sort of determine what actually amounts to cultural property under um, these war crimes. And so a number of cases involving the destruction of schools, mosques, churches, um, and other um, historical monuments, um, there was limits put on to what could be protected. And so in most cases, you had destruction, which was of um, clearly heritage sites, so like the old town of Dubrovnik, um, where there was no military objects, there was no military outposts or tanks or any way was sort of justifying the tax of what was effectively cultural property. And in those cases like Jokic, uh, Strugar, you had people convicted for destroying what was effectively historical monuments um, and cultural property. But you also have the court sort of limiting um, what actually cultural property is being protected. And so it doesn't allow the protection of uh, all religious and all educational buildings. Um, it goes back to the 1954 Hague Convention and points to that these, uh, what is cultural property, are those which are of great importance. So not just the fact that educational institutions or charity um, or historical monuments, but actually requiring it to be of a great importance. And so important to, to, to our people um, or important for all humankind. So it tries to raise the threshold uh, to what can be protected and what amounts to a war crime. Uh, at the same time, it also expanded protection 
that um, it was quite flexible in terms of how things were attacked and destroyed. Um, it didn't um, where a, a, a culture property object was destroyed. It didn't matter if there was a military object in the vicinity. Um, so say if there was a tank that was going past near this, uh, this church or um, a mosque, it didn't matter. And um, the fact that it was directly attacked uh, was enough to satisfy the war crime. Where these issues get difficult, is where you've got those who are being um, prosecuted for these crimes justifying the way in which they attack these objects. Because the way of getting out of being prosecuted for these crimes is to say it's either required by military necessity or that the cultural property object was being used by the enemy and so you were justified in protecting it. And this comes down to this issue of distinction. So in international humanitarian law, it's a, it's a cardinal principle that you can't attack uh, objects which aren't military objectives directly. So you can't attack civilian buildings, you can't attack um, hospitals um, and cultural property. You can, though, as an exception, attack it where it becomes a military objective in the sense that it's being used or by its nature, location or purpose has become a military objective. And so you had a number of cases where defendants would say that we destroyed a mosque because the enemy was using it um, to store weapons, or um, as a, a sniper's vantage point. And so um, under those grounds, it was, it was up to then the prosecution to prove that it wasn't being used militarily at the time, or that there was no evidence to support what the defendant is saying. And we see this um, in other conflicts, such as in Syria, where international humanitarian law gives too much freedom to military to commanders to destroy culture properly based on the issue of military objective or even military necessity that it's necessary to destroy these buildings because cultural protection is, is quite easily lost and we see this in current conflicts um, in Gaza and elsewhere in the Middle East where um, military commanders based on intelligence they have at the time justify an attack um, against objects which are normally protected and it would be prohibited to directly attack them and um, so there's a lot of leeway given in, in international humanitarian law to destroy things um, and it's, it's easy for militaries to destroy things than it is to rebuild them. Um, and this replaced through even to the International Criminal Court, where there's a specific crime of directing attacks against um, historical monuments, in fact, the cultural property, provided they're not being used as a military objective. So again, it's that sort of get out. And so the first case on this issue, the al Makhdi case involving the destruction of the mausoleums in Timbuktu, um, the defendant pled guilty. But there was an attack on cultural property, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, that um, wasn't being used militarily. So this issue didn't arise. Um, but what it means then for how we protect things in international humanitarian law and also international criminal law is, is quite a high hierarchy. And it's something which the Perlich case tried to engage with. And it's, it's just a mess. Like it's, it's the judges disagreed, the prosecution got themselves tied up in knots. Um, but effectively, it's because what the law is under the laws of armed conflict um, or international humanitarian law doesn't protect objects within military use. And we see this as civilian objects. We see civilian neighborhoods being completely destroyed um, because the first question is, is it being used as a military objective? And if it is being used by the enemy to store weapons, to transport troops as a place for firing um, against their enemy, then it loses the protection and can be targeted. Um, What's different is that cultural property um, in general doesn't um, fall under this. So education, religious, historic monuments, um, if it's the question of their being militarily used, then they can be targeted straight away. Um, if there are cultural properties of great importance, so those which are um, you know, of importance to uh, humanity or to a people, then there's requirements within the second protocol of the Hague Convention um, that requires you know, a waiver and requires a senior government official to sign off an attack because of the destruction and loss that can be made, but also requires those who are carrying an attack to give a warning. Um, and this is something similar we see with medical objects, um, such as hospitals and ambulances being attacked. You can't just bomb them straight away because they're being, you have intelligence that's being used as a military um, objective. There has to be some sort of warning. And I think this sort of mindset of, you know, trying to restrain violence plays through then in the Perlich case. And Helen spoke briefly already about this, that two of the individuals were um, charged with the destruction of the Starry Most. Um, 
as well as a whole range of other um, destruction of what we would broadly understand as cultural property, um, as well as attacks on civilians. And you know, Jeremy Bowen speaking there, and you know, speaking more recently on TV, there's there's a lot of um, parallels between the horrors of war, where you've got a civilian population in an urban area being bombarded, being starved, um, and the mass destruction. Like, how do we sort of account for this? How do we sort of ensure that this doesn't happen again? That we don't forget these crimes to happen. And so the prosecution um, has was what twenty five charges against the six defendants. Um, Two of the charges, counts 20 and 21, count 20 was about wanton destruction, not justified by military necessity. And count 21 was the destruction of um, effectively education and religious buildings. And the problem with the ICTY case was that it sort of um, branded the bridge as being a religious building. Um, and you saw there in the video that you know it wasn't, it, it was ethanized by the war itself. And the prosecution went that way in order to sort of capture that um, this bridge it was an exemplar and symbolic of the physical destruction as a way of sort of um, terrorizing and ethnically cleansing uh, Bosnian Muslims from the area. Um, the case itself that found these individuals, um, it, it, it's it, 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 like, it's one of the longest cases probably at the ICY in terms of words. It's over 2,600 pages long. Um, like <laughs> I haven't read it all, <laughs> um, and as a few lawyers have, it took two two and a half years to draft this whole judgment, and even at the end of it, it then got appealed, and these issues were overturned. And so, in the first instance, so in the trial chamber, um, it found these two defendants guilty, um, of the war crime of destruction, and it found that even though the bridge itself was being used uh, by Bosnian uh, forces to transfer weapons and as a way of continuing their lines of communication that made it a military target. And um, so in a way it justified in terms of distinction, the Croat forces target in the bridge. It found that the impact upon the civilian population in the, the enclave um, was disproportionate. And so it was looking at the psychological effect of bombardment on civilians that made them feel that it was more about wanton destruction. But what we see here is judges getting confused in their own judgments that they find that um, the bridge itself was initially charged under counts 21 in terms of destruction of a religious building and, and cited with different mosques. And the judges are interpreting it as a broader crime under count 20 of wanton destruction because of the disproportionate effect it had on the civilians. And so what we have then is the president of the chamber um, sorry, um, disagreeing from the majority. And the majority is to give a justification that even though in terms of military necessity and it being used as a military objective, it, that it was a, a viable military target, it had a significant psychological impact. Um, and so it's confusing of all the charges. And so the presiding judge, um, Antonelli, um, said that there's no war crime here um, when it comes to the bridge. Um, that's for the military to target this bridge offered them a definitive military advantage. It ignored the fact that there was other there was another bridge not far away that was being used as well. Um, but for him, the principle of distinction, that if this military target, the military can attack it, and it's necessary for them to get an advantage over the enemy. And so this issue of proportionality about the amount of force that's permissible to use doesn't come into it. And this is a problem um, with lawyers, you know, over 20 years on and senior judges interpreting the facts of the past and for them to, in hindsight, determine what, how commanders should act. And so under international humanitarian law, there's, it tries to be neutral. It doesn't give space to political motivation in terms of destruction. A clear destruction of the bridge was politically motivated. It wasn't that necessary to give a military advantage to the Croat forces. But the defendants were able to use the law in order to just justify their destruction. Um, and this is what we continue to see today. The, the wars of the past 20, 30 years, we've seen massive urban destruction justified under the laws of war. Because the laws of war is written by states. We have for the last 100 years used air warfare to obliterate civilian populations and their enemies. And so when the case was then appeals, um, the appeals chamber agreed with Judge um, Antonelli. And so it's 
even though the defendants were convicted of um, the destruction of the bridge as wanton destruction, the Peel's Chamber um, overruled this and said that it was completely wrong, that it was a military objective, um, it was justified by military necessity to attack it, and the notion of proportionality doesn't come into this issue. They deal with it in quite a short term, and um, there's a few paragraphs actually dedicated to the bridge itself. And so, um, despite the old theatrics of one of the defendants, you know, drinking cyanide and killing himself, um, this charge and the fact that they were acquitted of this um, is, is quite problematic. And so, again, another again another senior judge in this case then uh, disagrees with the majority and says that it is disproportionate because the 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 Peel's chamber um, erroneous, um, it's misleading, and they've got the law wrong in this area. So, in other words. Um, you have a, a, a quite a divide within senior international judges in this area um, about what we should be protecting. And this reflects the sort of the purpose of international humanities law and international humanitarian law in the efforts to try to protect property, cultural property in conflict. Um, but then struck by this issue, this sort of countervailing force of military necessity that sort of cuts across um, the laws of war and international criminal law when it comes to war crimes, that it's it's trying to justify violence, and um, whereas international humanitarian law is trying to restrain it in some way. And so the, the judges um, who were saying that proportionality should be taken into account is trying to go back to this notion that total war can't be waged. You can't just bomb whatever you want because you think it's a military objective. There has to be restraints in terms of the consequences of that. And so continually firing for for nearly a day into a bridge um, for them was completely seen as disproportionate. And Judge Pokar says that it's not only wanton destruction, it also is counts one and counts 25. Counts one was about persecution and count 25 was about terror of civilian population. That destroying the bridge was um, more evident of a wider attack against this enclave population under siege. It was a way to terrorize them. And you saw it in the video about people crying, about people being in despair, about um, how it sort of just cut them off and made them feel isolated during this conflict. That was a way of sort of collectively punishing civilians. Um, and the bridge was sort of just an edifice of that. It was just a physical reminder. It's also a question about how we sort of anthropomorphize physical objects and how we connect them to human beings that under international humanitarian law, we're, it's, it's that balance between you know, trying to limit war, but trying to also allow the military to operate. Um, whereas some of the judges here are trying to say that we need to think about the, how this violence affects people. And so in terms of lessons um, from this case, and also about uh, the story most, is that you have senior judges confused about this issue. There is no clarity that's brought about, um, that even with the appeals chamber acquits the defendants, um, there's still fundamental disagreements. Um, and it's not going to be solved with how it's framed within the Rome Statute. I think that proportionality should be taken into account because otherwise, under the laws of war, um, and when it comes to war crimes, we can too easily allow people to destroy things um, because they're based on a military objective. Um, and we see this in the conflict in Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, that we get quite detached from the reality of conflict. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about how many bombs have been dropped, were dropped on ISIS and Raqqa and Mosul and, and you know in Gaza in, in recent weeks. Um, but we don't uh, appreciate the physical impact of those bombs. And it's, it's nearly 25, over 25 years ago since the IRA blew up Canary Wharf with a 3,000 pound bomb. And the average bomb that's dropped um, in an airstrike is 2,000 pound bomb. So a 3,000 pound bomb, one bomb in Canary Wharf destroyed the whole area. Um, to cause one billion pounds in damage. And yet, in places like Raqqa, Mosul, and Gaza, you have thousands of these bombs being destroyed. The destruction is massive. The effects on civilians psychologically. I, I grew up where all the villages in town around me were blown up. Um, we had you know historical buildings that were destroyed, not really cultural property, but fundamentally ripped apart and caused the division of communities um, that will last you know, for generations. And so we should be considering the psychological impact on communities. It should give commanders when they attack these sort of objects, pause for reflection. That yes, there's a military objective. Yes, we should attack the enemy, but 
we don't want to make this war more protracted. We don't want to cause the community to be turned against us. Um, and so coalition forces in, in Iraq and Syria to try to limit the way in which they attacked religious and cultural property buildings, instead of using airstrikes, you know, bringing in snipers or specialist forces to take out the enemy rather than completely destroying them because you're just going to turn people against you. And so I think when we think about, you know, the ICTY, it failed in prosecuting anybody for the destruction um, of the Starry Mosque. Um, it tried, um, but nobody ultimately was convicted. What it did do, though, however, was establish the truth. Um, and so people talk about trials being a place of collective memory um, and a space to sort of establish the truth. And in many ways, you saw the defendants are sort of justifying they didn't know that it wasn't our forces. But fundamentally, it was established that the HVO, HVO Croat forces destroyed the bridge. And so it is a place of establishing the facts. It's difficult to get justice in these sort of situations, um, but at least establish the truth. And so in conclusion, um, this is the struggle with international justice. You know, the International Criminal Court and these international justice bodies can't save us. Law itself is fragmented um, and doesn't always offer the best solutions. And so we can't always expect that these people who destroy cultural property will see their day in court. But what we can do is try to encourage those who use force or use violence to restrain themselves and to think about how the impact will be on the civilian population. And also then the long-term effects, the reverberating effects of explosive weapons in urban areas, how best we can use the law to protect things for the next generation. So thank you for your attention today. Um, and I'll have questions at the end. Maybe. Yeah, or no. <laughs> Any questions? Just a couple of seconds. Yes. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, one of the things that, that stands out for me is that most of the legal frameworks focus on individual buildings or buildings as objects. Um, and obviously, that's important for certain reasons. But in cities, there's the question of areas, neighborhoods, groups of buildings. And um, it, it's, it's often not so much the problem of, a, of an individual case as, as a, you know, a, a much wider um, urban fabric that ultimately is important for how cities are rebuilt or, or um, certainly the psychological value of it and a lot of the things you're talking about. So I'm wondering if in the law um, there's any recognition of the fact that it's actually a much more complex situation than identifying a, a single important historical building. Yeah, no, th thank you. That's, that's a good point. I suppose one of the difficult, so within the Hague uh, Convention 1954 and also Second Protocol, there are provisions to allow collective places of refuge um, and give sort of enhanced protection. The difficulty is that you can't make a, an area immune from attack if there's potentially dual use objects. So objects such as railway networks, such as bridges that can be used by the enemy to transport troops. So um, it's the challenge of trying to create places which will be immune from attack um, while at the same time not allowing the enemy to misuse that collective area immunity. So I think um, there is about a dozen at the moment of areas around the world where states have signed up to protect a whole area. Um, and so if those areas are attacked, um, it's quite a clear um, issue that this wasn't a military objective and so it was could be a mount of war crime. But the difficulty is in an urban area, you can't separate out, um, you know, say anywhere in London, which is could be considered yeah. cultural heritage. Yeah. You can't just divide the city up. What that also speaks to then is that when you're, um, it's a broader issue that you can't carry indiscriminate um, attacks on civilians, which have a wide area of effect. So you can't just drop explosive carpet bomb over a whole city. You have to like use precise attacks. So um, it's, it's the trying to get the balance between immunity for cultural property, um, particularly those which are world heritage, um, against 
allowing the military to attack objects which in the vicinity. And so the difficulty is with airstrikes is they can have explosive effects up to 300, 400 meters. So you have to think about then how would you protect an area which wouldn't be affected in that way. Make sense? So you're saying it's, it's primarily a problem of definition. I mean, there's no question a group is much more complex or a whole neighborhood is much more complex to define than an individual building. Um, and, and our planning laws are set up um, in a lot of ways to, to designate buildings. And it's, it's always easier, but I'm just wondering, is the law going in the direction of, of looking at, at um, m these more complex situations? The law, the law does provide for like sort of different levels of protection. And one of them is a, a place of refuge where you can store um, supposed movable more objects. When it comes to immovable, um, it can be areas of enhanced protection, and those have to be communicated. Um, but if they're used by the military in any way, then they can be subjected to an attack. But there, there's a whole range of um, procedures that has to be followed. So I think the way the law has been moving, and people who work in this area can speak better than this, but is to engage armed actors, you know, armed groups, state forces, in order to think about how they go about carrying out attacks, how they try to protect cultural property and respect it, rather than trying to change the law as such, as it's by trying to change the mindset and the way in which people attack. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for the, the great presentation so far. It's been really, really interesting. If I may just add one point to that, in the definition, there is actually something on, on group of, uh, of buildings specific, specifically, but I think perhaps cases, Focusing on the on one, I think it was also the point that perhaps that was made earlier on just one building doesn't help for also states to know that they should also implement some protection for for groups of monuments. One question I, I have for you, um, um, perhaps also for for Helen, because you were mentioning the legal framework was not sufficient, and you mentioned the the ninety nine protection. It sounds I, I really liked your point about the judges mixing up the the, the principles. You you're really right. So is it a matter of of judges getting better training also on IHL? Or do you think that the 99 protocol, the second protocol changed anything, improved anything? Or how, or should it be uh, improved further uh, with, a, with a third protocol? What is your view on that? If there should be more law or it's just a better implementation of the current law? Yeah. Um, as a lawyer, I'm an advocate against more law because <laughs> more law doesn't solve the problem. Um, and our colleague, Emery Lost, I will talk about the, the problem is when you create all this law, there's a risk of atomization. It's, it's so come so fragmented because some states sign up for some laws and others don't, and you're fighting in a coalition who's bound by what. I think um, the second protocol um, you know, was brought about um, in terms of armed conflict to sort of define things more clearly when it came to this issue of enhanced protection and also the issue of waiver when it came to... Um, trying to better protect those objects which have value to a people and, and to the community. The problem is that in a lot of situations, you've got cultural property which doesn't rise to that level. And so then we're dealing with an issue which doesn't get to the issue of um, requiring a waiver and can only be destroyed under a period of military necessity. The difficulty is with the second protocol, it brings in the notion of imperative. Um, so it brings in a new term which lawyers can disagree about. Whereas you know, 1907 talks about military necessity. The IC Rome statute talks about military object. So we've got different concepts. And so maybe it is that judges need to be better trained, but trying to get senior judges to go to an educational class would be you know, difficult. But I, th I, think, I think what this fundamentally speaks to is the discretion that's given to commanders to attack things. Just, you know, it's, I, I'm concerned that it's an issue of whack-a-mole when it comes to IHL. If it's a military objective, attack. Um, and there's no then restraint about how you think about the way you're attacking and its implication for civilians. Um, and that's problematic with civilian objects. It's problematic with medical um, hospitals. Um, and um, also then it comes to cultural property. And, and we've seen this, you know, in the Middle East, but also like in Ukraine, where, you know, Amnesty was attacked for saying that, um, you know, Russia was attacking objects within city centers, but then also the Ukrainian military were operating in that area. Like this is not explicitly a war crime per se. So it's it's a difference between what we expect the law should be um, in terms of our aspirations of protecting people and things which we value and want to retain for the next generation versus 
the realities of war. So thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry, more questions. If that's okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, really fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask a question that's sort of building actually on what's been asked already um, about, if I remember right, uh, towards the beginning of the presentation, you were talking about how the threshold's been sort of attempted to be raised about, you know, um, sort of uh, cultural heritage items of particular significance, or I can't remember the exact wording. Um, and I just wanted to ask a little bit about the kind of practicalities of that and how that kind of definitionally or, or yeah, in practice, how that's sort of been designed and evaluated, what counts as, you know, something of, of particular significance, you know, particularly because, I mean, that's so obviously dependent on the actors in, and the agents engaged in, you know, who that may be, whether it's sort of more localized community members who place particular significance on, on this place or more political elites or international actors. And I was just wondering if you could, I don't know if there are, what the precedent's been in, across different cases, if you could just speak to that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of the ICY, um, you did have that sort of difference between um, objects which um, are of um, importance to all people. So like the attack of the old town in Dubrovnik versus, you know, attacks on schools. Um, which the local community would see as like like a local place of worship as something fundamentally of cultural heritage to them. But the courts, so some of the cases I mentioned are specifically on attacks of schools and, and places of worship. But under under IHL, they're seen as civilian objects. They don't rise to that sort of level. I don't want to step too much on, on Rob's talk as well. Rob's going to probably stick specifically to this issue. Um, but there is that sort of difference. And so this, the second protocol sort of spells out of what things which are of great importance um and things would happen like enhanced protection so there is a gradated sort of approach to it and it does depend somewhat and um, interestingly in, in the icc in the destruction of timbuktu you had the court trying to weigh up both the being a unesco world heritage site um but also being something which is intimately connected to people who had their ancestors you know their mausoleums destroyed and, and their monuments um, and so it recognized that um mali as a state was a victim the whole humanity represented by UNESCO was a victim. Um, but then, uh, you know, fundamentally, the local community was impacted by those attacks, especially those family members. Uh, and so in terms of reparation, it then sort of prioritized those family members first before the community, and then before Mali and UNESCO, which got like a symbolic one euro each. So there's ways of sort of recognizing that. It's not always in terms of how to prosecute. So thanks for the question. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. I just wanted to add that um, for me, it's also a question of enforcement. You know, it's you may have more laws, but do they get enforced? And uh, the inter where there will not be an international criminal tribunal for Ukraine. Uh, Russia was one of the uh, Security Council members who approved the formation of the international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So. You know, this isn't going to happen. Um, uh, there may be some kind of tribunal, but maybe it'll be in Ukraine. The International Criminal Court, so uh, Luke mentioned the Mali prosecution, uh, but that was the uh, uh, the prosecutor of the time, this Fatou Ben Souda. She was interested in cultural heritage. I don't think Karim Khan is the slightest bit interested in cultural heritage protection at all. And uh, he, if you see, he is appointed about oh, 20, 21 special advisors, um, including people like Amal Clooney, and not a single one of them, not even Amal, is, uh, has anything to do with cultural heritage. There's all kinds of other things. They're all, you know, experts in particular fields, but he is, I don't think he has any interest whatsoever. So it's, it's going to be you know, who's going to prosecute, who's going to enforce it? Um, if the Ukrainians that would form their own, uh, you know, in, in Ukraine, uh, it probably won't be taken seriously. Uh, so uh, you know, to, to prosecute war crimes, including destruction of cultural property, and also this gathering of evidence to um, stand up, when you saw what happened here uh, at uh, the Yugoslav Tribunal. Um, evidence that will hold up in court, actual evidence and uh, real evidence. 
and a lot of the stuff that the ICTY had was paper evidence, and uh, that doesn't probably exist much anymore. So, you know, there's all these issues come up, and I think it's a lot of it's enforcement. Who's going to enforce it? So now we're going to hear Rob, Robert Bevan, who's going to be looking at the reconstructed bridge, the new old bridge, and some of the issues that arose that he considers arose from that. So I think that's about over to Robert. So hello everybody. Um, I'll just move this here. Let me know if you can't hear me, um, or if it's being fuzzy. Um, turn the light on. So um, I first visited Mostar when researching my 2006 book, The Destruction of Memory: Architecture at War. And last year I published Monumental Lies: Culture Wars and the Truth About the Past which amongst other things revisits Mostar and its bridge when discussing vital concepts of authenticity and the evidence the material world provides to history. When the Taliban blew up the Bamiyan Buddhas uh, in 2001, the international uh, heritage community was clear. The fragments were well beyond reassembly, their niches would stay empty. UNESCO agreed that however sorrowful their loss, there was no possibility of their authentic reconstruction. That would be fakery. Contrary to long-standing conservation principles, such as the Venice Charter, that demanded authenticity and working with ruins and damaged and altered buildings. But Bamiyan was unfortunately far from an exceptional example of monuments deliberately targeting conflicts. And the decision not to reconstruct also had important, also hid important changes to conservation philosophy and politics that were already underway, not least within UNESCO itself. Nowhere is this more evident than in the reconstruction of Mostar Bridge. The war in the former Yugoslavia was catastrophic for culture, highlighting the issue of attacks on monuments in ways that hadn't been seen since the Second World War. And as you know, the region's Ottoman heritage was a particular casualty, and this wasn't usually the consequence of being on a front line, but part of a deliberate pattern of cultural cleansing happening alongside a violent ethnic cleansing and genocide of towns and villages, where heritage destruction was being weaponized alongside mass murder and mass rape. The aim was a historical erasure to remove any proof that a community had, um, had uh, lived in a particular territory for centuries, especially in coexistence with other cultural groups, by removing the evidence of uh, their historic presence, ensuring that the expelled had no reason to return. The 1993 destruction of Mostar Bridge was somewhat more unusual in that it was both on the front line and a symbolic target. The destruction by the Croat artillery in 1993 was a defining moment of the Bosnian War, a symbol of the city, its collapse into the river below after concerted shelling marked the completion of the ethno-nationalist segregation of what had once been one of the most the country's most multicultural cities. The war saw Muslims driven out of their homes in the west and centre of Mostar over the river and the survivors come confined to essentially the ruins of the East Bank. In 1994, at the same time that UNESCO was taking the decision to rebuild Story Most, a panel of international heritage experts met in Nara in Japan to hammer out the Nara, the Nara documentation on authenticity, an important revision to the Venice Charter's precepts. The Nara document has cons consequently been seen as a direct response to the Yugoslav conflict, rising out of concern about destruction and the, enti and the entirely inauthentic and prejudicial reconstruction projects that were used in the cover of war to build new and inauthentic nationalist monuments on historic sites, but whose real aim was to cement ethnic cleansing. However, the issue has deeper origins. While the concept 
concept of authenticity as a long-standing one, the word itself hadn't been used, or at least initially, in later key international texts, such as the 1972 World Heritage Convention, that, among other measures, established the World Heritage Site Programme, which is added in later guidance. And decades before NARA, arguments had raged as to whether to that whether rebuilt central Warsaw or the French citadel of Carcassonne, that had been gussed up by Violet Le Duc, were sufficiently authentic to qualify as World Heritage Sites. The arguments intensified from the late 70s as member states began to understand the national prestige and lucrative tourism potential that a World Heritage Site listing could bring. In particular, Japan wanted to add its temple sites to the World Heritage Sites list and was worried that Western concepts of authenticity, seen as a cultural imperialism in some quarters, might provide a block in, to inclusion because of Shinto's ceremonial reconstruction practices at temples. So Nara may have been a long time emerging, but it was the devastation in Bosnia that was the urgent context and the mood music for its agreement. As its preamble, preamble notes, in a world where there is an there, that is increasingly subject to the focus of globalization, forces of globalization and homogenization, and in a world in which the search for cultural identity is sometimes pursued through aggressive nationalism and the suppression of the cultures of minorities, the essential co contribution made by the consideration of authenticity and conservation practice is to clarify and illuminate the collective memory of humanity. And at first glance, this is excellent stuff, and part of it is. But the NARA document's expanding list of attributes determining authenticity went beyond materiality to include intangible and nebulous ones such as tradition and feeling, the centrality of facts, evidence, and authentic material fabric was diluted. So in a world where scientific truths are ever more resisted, NARA, while apparently re reaffirming Venice Charter principles, has also been the springboard for worrying departures from good, good practice that had previously safeguarded the genuineness of material artifacts as the evidence of the past. It introduced, it introduced loose and unscientific ideas such as spirit. The NARA document ultimately argues that a principal requirement of authenticity is that, um, is that information about a place may be understood, my emphasis, understood as credible or truthful. And understood is a, as true is a dangerously loose conception of truth in a post-truth world. It's not the same as true. And new practices influenced by UNESCO's own real politic and myth-making are now being promulgated under NARA's broader definition of the authentic. It has helped justify decisions such as declaring Old Mostar Bridge, which had been entirely rebuilt in 2004, along with the surrounding Ottoman buildings, to be a freshly minted World Heritage Site. The Old Bridge area and the, of the old city of Mostar was duly inscribed by UNESCO on the list the following year, 2005. This was despite the updated guidance for selecting World Heritage, World Heritage Sites, making authenticity an explicit requirement for inclusion. UNESCO documentation justifying Mostar's World Heritage inclusion is maddening in its evasions and wishful thinking. Um, and Mustar, as Helen talked about, Mustar's Starry Grad had won the prestigious Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 1986, following an exemplary restoration by Amir Passage. And much of this work would have been reduced to rubble, but extensive documentation survived. Um, after the 1995 Dayton Accords that divided Bosnia into ethnic cantons as the price of peace, an international effort to reconstruct the bridge commenced under UNESCO's guiding hand. Those living in post-war post Mostar were not largely the same cosmopolitan pre-war population who had fled, but included many internal refugees from the countryside, less versed in urban diversity, 
and who under Dayton lived infinitely more segregated lives than the pre-war Mosterians. Funds for the rebuilding focus mainly on the bridge for its symbolic value. The largest share of the 15.8 million plus cost came from the World Bank through a 35 year learning and innovation loan. As a pilot project aimed at promoting social reconciliation and, de and development through the reconstruction of Mostar's cultural heritage. It was argued that reconciliation in, in a post-conflict environment was a prerequisite, prerequisite for economic regeneration. So the World Bank project specifically aimed to, quote, improve the climate for reconcil reconciliation among the peoples in Bosnia and Herzegovina through recognition and rehabilitation of their common cultural heritage in Mostar, end quote. So work began in the summer of 2001 and was completed three years later. And while some of the destroyed bridges stones were hauled up, hauled up from the riverbed, as we saw in the images before, the great majority of the masonry was too pul pulverized or otherwise damaged to be put back in place as per the Venice Charter. Instead, new stone was quarried. Engineer Gilles Picot led the preparatory stage and wanted to use both Croat and Bosnian masons to be trained in a new stone masonry school in an effort to help heal divisions. This initiative swiftly closed again when the main construction contract was given to a large Turkish company. Uh, Picot's observation that the beauty of the old bridge derived in part from the sum of the errors committed in its original design and the corrections made through history was also ignored in the rebuild. Even though it was skillfully and expertly reconstructed using traditional techniques, the inconvenient truth is that the Starry Most is not the old bridge reassembled, but materially a brand new bridge. Despite being a copy, albeit constructed using traditional methods, the relevant UNESCO text talks about, quotes, the authenticity of the form, use of authentic materials and techniques. It avoids referring to original materials being resembled, because that didn't really happen, but argues instead that, quote, remaining original material has been exposed in a museum, becoming an inseparable part of the reconstruction. As an argument for authenticity by the planet's leading heritage body, a separate museum display of the original stones is, to use a technical term, bullshit. So it's, um, it's so if we look at, that's the bridge before, uh, uh, um, uh, that's the, sorry, the reconstructed bridge, looking very smooth. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a 1895 image where you can see the sort of the patina, the, the, the changes, the wear, uh, and that wasn't uh, uh, included uh, within the rebuilt bridge. It was, it was an approximation rather than a facsimile. Um, but the lingering UNESCO's linguistic gymnastics continue with the phrase that the, quote, reconstruction has not been hidden at all. Our construction hardly uh, uh, occurred behind closed doors. This wording conceals the fact that the rebuilt bridge does not incorporate the scars of its past traumas. It's not a layered critical reconstruction that properly redifferentiates new work from old or incorporates the experience of war. Further, the bridge itself is not the exclusive focus of the World Heritage Site inscription. The components cited for inclusion in the World Heritage Site extended to carefully rebuilt Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian buildings nearby, some of which had been reduced to knee-high rubble in the war, as well as the archeological remains of, near, of the early and pre-Ottoman period and the intangible value of the wider river valley landscape. Was this decision to cast the net wide uh, in order to sidestep too close a focus on the inauthenticity of the bridge itself? What you see today across much of the bridge area is expertly copied, but it's only patchily authentic. UNESCO's assessment of the townscape remains genuine in its key features, 
and architectural landmarks is also wider the mark when one takes into account the giant Catholic crosses and outsized church campanile built to glower over Muslim Mostar in the manner of segregationist Confederate statues. Um, here you see, uh, uh, again, the, 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 the difference uh, beyond the bridge there, some of those reconstructed um, uh, buildings, often in, from great ruins, and here, uh, these are on the, on the bridge approach, the bare, not much left there, but the, you can see the reconstructions next to them next door. Um, You know, they're, re they're, they're rebuilds rather than repairs. A further argument made for its inclusion on the UNESCO list was that pre-war, the bridge had been a symbol of plurality and its destruction a symbol of division. So its reconstruction was a metaphorical bridging of the communities. Certainly the, the bridge was a symbol of the city, but whether it was ever a symbol of plurality per se is another matter. Um, it's a more complex question, and we'll hear more about that later. Such symbols weren't really necessary until the war caused divisions, and symbolism does not, in any case, neatly map onto authenticity. Mostar's World Heritage description argues that the old bridge area is a, quotes, an outstanding example of a multicultural urban settlement, and states that the reconstructed bridge and old city are quotes, a symbol of reconciliation, international cooperation, and of coexistence of diverse cultural, ethnic, and religious communities. Again, we'll see that's not true. Some have argued that the site satisfies criteria six that requires a site to be direct, directly or tangibly associated with events or living traditions, with ideas or with beliefs, with artistic and literary works of, ac of outstanding universal significance, OUV, outstanding universal value. It was argued that its very destruction lent it additional outstanding universal value. The result, a less than decade old project supervised by UNESCO it itself is here stretching the concepts of world heritage and authent authenticity to breaking point and beyond, all in the name of symbolism. Um, and we can see here, I don't know if you can read that. This is a, a UNESCO page from a, grab from a UNESCO page um, where it says things like, it has set a precedent in peace building processes and shows that our shared heritage can be a basis for social, sorry, I've missed the bit in the middle of that, but it, you, you get the drift. Um, uh, it, 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 it is uh, uh, creating reconciliation. That, that, that's the crucial argument. Um, just as important, the ability of a reconstructed bridge to bring reconciliation and coexistence to Mostar directly contradicts facts on the ground. Mostar remains as divided as ever, despite attempts to force West Mostar's Croats and the Muslims east of the river to her cohabit. Overall, Croats now dominate. A reconstructed high school near the bridge remains indicative of the continued standoff. It has both Muslim and Croat pupils under one roof, but in separate classrooms with separate teachers and separate curricula. The only place the next generations of Mostarians meet in this school is when they need to use the loo. Pupils and parents rarely step on foot of the rebuilt, of the rebuilt bridge to cross to the other community on its respective sides. Things may have shifted recently, but at the time of the bridges rebuilding, Mostar had two telephone networks, two hospitals, two refuse collection services, two football clubs, two universities, etc. As a consequence of this division, thousands of new graduates leave the city each year to escape. Professor Azra Hamadzic, in her book, Citizens of an Empty Nation, argues that the cantonizing Dayton's Accords that assigned Bosnian Serbs their own self-governing region was a model that denies Bosnia's pre-war pluralist history. Where places such as the high school do not simply reflect the ethnic di divisions in Bos Bos Bosnian society, but reproduce them. There are no shared spaces in the city, 
only ethnic spaces observe, she observes. Arguably, the reconstructed bridge, while presenting an all too easy metaphor and image of connection, is an attempt to conceal the failures of the international community to rebuild deeper, more effective connections. Even at the time of reconstruction, Amir Pashik warned, the bridge is not so important. Education is the key to, in this town. Pashik meant co-education, co but so far from the bridge achieving reconciliation, ethnic nationalist tensions in Mostar have been worsening in recent years. Given UNESCO's mandate for securing peace, it's not surprising that the organization is highly invested in reconstruction and reconciliation. And it can feel like an obvious truth um, that the reconstruction of a destroyed monument brings communities back together. But there's a conspicuous lack of evidence to support this deterministic belief. In fact, partial or nationalist tinged reconstruction efforts could just as well intensify divisions, as we've seen all over Eastern Europe, in India, and in Turkey's destructive conservation efforts at Armenian and Kurdish sites within its borders. Um, Thomas Hofnung, writing in Liberation in November 2003, quoted various locals in his article on the Bridge Reconstruction Project. Quote, it's a symbol of Turkish occupation, said Stanko, a well-dressed old gentleman after Sunday Mass. Nine years after the Second World War, he wrote, the lowest common denominator of the two mosque stars is in this pithy observation drawn up by Yasmina, a Bosnian pregnant with her first child. Quote, the construction of a monument has never reconciled people. Um, but the reconciliation argument is one that UNESCO and its followers have since repeated used elsewhere, such as the justification for rebuilding mud shrines in Timbuktu, destroyed by Isla Islamist insurgents in 2012, which akin to Shinto shrines, were at least regularly resurfaced with new earth, so there was a process there. This does not mean reconciliation has been achieved in this part of Mali, far from it. UNESCO's self-serving but unscientific arguments are playing fast and loose with the material evidence of damaged places as it ties itself in knots to justify inauthentic reconstruction decisions on political grounds. While reconstructing monuments destroyed by aggressors in the name of ethnic cleansing and genocide, the ultimate culture wars, can have a strong moral justification, these spe special circumstances are simultaneously eroded when the form of the reconstruction conceals the trauma of its initial destruction. Denying to history the very evidence of past events, erasing object lessons in the consequences of division and war. It is right to resist genocide heirs by frustrating the cultural component of genocidal efforts and reinstating the architectural artifacts that demonstrate a multicultural city was a reality in the past and the aim in the future. But one not, need not qualify, justify that stance with leisure demand about authenticity, world heritage qualification, or reconciliation. So while it is justified to rebuild Old Mosta and its symbolic, symbolic bridge in the face of ethnic cleansers and genocide heirs, when, you, you, when, you, when UNESCO then declare the results to be an authentic world heritage site, it is undermining truth the facts of history. UNESCO has an unfortunate record on this score, notably with the facsimile old town of Warsaw, which after a degree of hesitation was eventually included in a World Heritage Society in 1980. Again, the reconstruction of monuments in the face of Nazi physical and cultural genocide of the city Slavs and Jews has many justifications. But must this inauthentic Warsaw also be regarded as a World Heritage Site? And what justification is there for the inaccuracies in the inscription text that describes the Warsaw's old town as an, quote, identical reconstruction, when as conservation experts know full well, it is far from identical. The arguments are becoming ever more specious. At a Nikomos conference held in the Polish capital in 2018, 
the organization issued the Warsaw Recommendation on Recovery and Reconstruction for World Heritage Cultural World Cultural Heritage. Inspired by the city in which it was meeting, it justifies the inclusion of Warsaw on the World Heritage List of War Destroyed Places on the basis that the destruction itself adds to its heritage significance, its outstanding universal value. And that designation is in the interests of social justice and reconciliation. This turns authenticity on its head, makes the consequences of the destruction of the authentic something to be valued. A similar approach took, took place when the Bamiyan Valley was made a World Heritage Site in 2003. The inscription here emphasizes the wider Bamiyan land, landscape as one of, quotes, rec recurring reactions to iconic art. The very absence of the two sculptures at its heart thus becomes an argument justifying its inclusion. Chasing illusions in this way is becoming not just foolish, but cynical. It undermines trust in the organization's disinterested expertise, and ultimately, therefore, in UNESCO's peace-building premise. Manipulating the concept of authenticity in this way has consequences for the maintenance of material truths worldwide, well beyond any battlefield. And the contradictions are becoming ever more obvious. In 2009, UNESCO's World Heritage Committee decided to remove Dresden from the World Heritage List, the first cultural site to be struck off in this fashion because of the potential damage caused to its setting by a pros, proposed new road bridge over the Elbe Valley. Um, uh, yet, this is Dresden today. Everything you see in that image, from the cobbles to the top of the Frauenkirk dome, is kind of has been completed in the past couple of decades. It's brand new, it's fake. Um, and one concert commentator has said that the traditional Florence on the Elbe description of, of Dresden has become the Las Vegas on the Elbe. And so the, this is the Neumarkt. And it's not just the focus of tourist visits to town. Look, Dresdeners generally locally don't use it much. It's, it's more watch shops and cafes. Um, it's also the focus of the far right, and it was during the construction of the Farankirke and the reconstruction of the new mark, uh, Pegida, the anti-Islam uh, uh, group, have marched to the marched to the construction site. Neo-Nazi Nazis marched towards the, to the construction site. It became it was kind of a a denial of of of. of of the consequences of war uh, uh, and a reflection of reunification tensions, political tensions. Yet the World Heritage Committee, which first inscribed the city on the World Heritage List in 2004, was entirely sanguine about the false Frauenkirche that was emerging and the faux Baroque mummifying Dresden's heart on a daily basis. It described the city as an artistic whole this is a city whose city centre was flattened, an artistic whole, and the Frauenkirche as part of an authentic re restoration, a correction of the city's skyline, as captured in the paintings of Bernard, Bernard, Bernardo Bellato and others. Which is more damaging to history and authenticity? An honestly new, if poorly sighted, bridge over the Elbe, or offering top level support to outright politically problematic fakery. What has changed about the assessment of Dresden since it was first refused World Heritage Site status in 1989 on the grounds that it was inauthentic and its acceptance in 2004, other than the erection of ever more false history. In between these two events, NARA was adopted and UNESCO's political expediency became ever more pronounced and conflict and crime crisis but climate crisis threats to heritage increased. UNESCO and some of its satellite organizations such as ICOMOS continue to question the value of authenticity, even asking whether it should be abandoned altogether as a concept. And while it feels wrong to, to kick UNESCO when it's down, founded as it was with such hope, following disasters of war and now assailed by the global right, the organization has lost its way its peak gatekeeper 
or uh, protecting the planet's past. For example, to date, UNESCO has still not created its code of ethics about digitally generated copies to determine when or how or whether they should be used. It remains to be seen if its attitude to reconstructing Bamyan's Buddhas will change given this newly relaxed attitude to authenticity. Before the Taliban retook the country in the summer of 2021, the Afghan Ministry of Culture and the governor of the Bamyan region both wanted at least one of the statues rebuilt with an eye to future tourism. Digital technologies would certainly make this an easier task, superficially at least. In some circumstances, copies do have a place. For instance, there's now a high quality copy of Tutankhamun's tomb at the Valley of the Kings to visit, which saves the original. And realistic uh, facsimile cave paintings uh, in, in artificial caverns in France and Spain. And again, they are saving the originals from damage. But these supplement rather than replace the originals that, uh, that were being damaged by tourism. And so there's a world of difference between a high quality reproduction that is clearly seen as such and one that replaces a lost original. You can, for example, choose between the excellent digital copy of Renese's masterpiece, The Wedding Feast at Cana, that hangs once more in its original location in Venice, in a Ven Venetian refectory, or the original in the Louvre that was looted by Napoleon. Uh, neither of these is necessarily masquerading as something it isn't. But these honest replicas still raise complications. Uh, in one study, tourists, tourists that were visiting the copy tomb of King Tut rated it more favorably than the original because their movements were less restricted. As a result, they felt that their replica was the more authentic experience. In a, te in a te test, uh, uh, um, by contrast, other, other studies suggest a different response. In a test con conducted by philosophers at the City University of New York, participants were told that they could choose between seeing the ashes of the real Mona Lisa after it's destroyed by fire or an undetectable duplicate of the painting. 80% chose the authentic ashes. And moving on, when eyewitnesses to, his to history uh, and to say the Holocaust, uh, or for that matter, survivors of the chemical attacks in Syria are no longer around to develop to uh, deliver their testimony in person. The material evidence of these episodes must remain as evidence. When not undermined by inauthentic, inauthentic reconstruction, the architectural record is a reliable witness, providing evidence of a pa of a pattern of actions with a particular purpose in mind. We can use this evidence of crimes to know something beyond reasonable doubt, including the crime of genocide. And um, if this, moving on, this is um, Crematoria 2 at, no, sorry, um, this is Crematoria 1 at Auschwitz. Uh, and this is a question of, of the importance of, of, of genuine uh, constructions. Uh, Holocaust deniers have been given something, some unwitting material to argue that Auschwitz was fake. This is because crematoria one that we see here was reconstructed after the war when Auschwitz became a memorial and museum. And this was done partly as a museological exercise, partly to reinforce narratives about Polish victimhood because this is where a lot of Poles died and partly simply because the genuine, uh, well, the, 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 the it, I should say that this was a genuine uh, uh, gas chamber and crematory, but it became disused when Birkenau was built and but tour and with some distance away, but, but uh, uh, tourists were too lazy to go there. So at Crematoria 1, which we see here, uh, the furnaces were rebuilt, the chimney was rebuilt, and the roof with the holes for the Zycon B pellets were, were rebuilt. Um, this is a problem. The official Auschwitz website still says this object is preserved in its original state to a large, large degree. 
but this isn't true. And because it isn't true, it gave, gives conspiracy theories and Holocaust deniers a way in. They take, they have no holes, no Holocaust, Holocaust mantra, uh, arguing that if there were no holes detected in the roofs of the gas chambers and the pellets didn't go in, therefore the gassing didn't happen, therefore the Holocaust didn't happen. This, is, th this argument was at the centre of the libel trial in which disgraced historian David Irving sued Deborah Lipstadt and Penguin books, um, ensuring ensuring those material uh, uh, um, material genuine material uh, 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 fabric remains is essential to resisting conspiracy theories and Holocaust deniers. This this is a genuine uh, uh, ruin of of a crematoria and gas chamber, which was subsequently. After a long, long search, they found the holes uh, that had delivered the pellets. They can sort of refuting the uh, Holocaust deniers' uh, lies. Um, and this matters in cases of you know genocide and ethnic cleansing, as we saw in Bosnia. But today, genocide has been defined in strictly corporeal terms rather than including culture. According to the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, genocide is the killing of members of a target group or causing them bodily or mental harm, inflicting de deadly living conditions, preventing births, and forcibly transferring the group's children to another group. All these are ways of attempting to destroy a group as a whole or in part. Establishing intent, is crucial in distinguishing genocide from other episodes where culture is attacked, such as war crimes and genocide's undefined cousin, ethnic cleansing. However, the convention does not consider the erasure of identity through cultural destruction, as was seen on Kristallnacht at the anniversary today, Mostar, or in Tibet at the hands of China, or, uh, in the, or the Uyghur since. It's not considered a method of erasing a group. And the trials that, 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 that uh, uh, were just taught, Luke just talked about at the uh, ICTY uh, were seen as making radical progress in addressing crimes of cultural destruction and conflicts. And from its establishment in 1993, courtrooms at The Hague um, heard more than a dozen cases addressing such cultural destruction cultural destruction as war crimes or crimes against humanity, both of which forbid willful damage to cultural sites. As the AICTY heard, monuments were not just collateral damage in, in the path of clashing armies, they were deliberately targeted for cultural cleansing to wipe away evidence of a community's existence in a given place. But the trials also demonstrated a continued failure since the Second World War to take the targeting of cultures fully into account, especially to accept the concept of cultural genocide, a term not self-recognized under international law for various historical and political reasons. I won't go into the details of the Mostar trial, Lucas covered that admirably. Um, we must recognize though that the ICTY proceedings showed time and again that cultural destruction and the cultural component of genocide and ethnic cleansing were sidelined in favor of attacks against the person, foregoing the, the ability to properly link heritage protection, identity, and human rights. Generally, more than half the prosecutions for attacks on cultural property at the ICTY failed, often arising, according to court judgments, from a failure to gather additional evidence including from eyewitnesses and forensic experts, and so limiting the contribution this destruction made to a full understanding of what was happening and why. The crucially important Cavendish case, which more than many others demonstrated the pattern of persecution, torture, concentration camps, war crimes and genocide, the vast and murderous political project was particularly dismal in this regard. For example, while he stood accused of terrorizing the citizens of Sarajevo, the single most symbolic act of destruction in that city, as Helen mentioned, the shelling of Bosnia's National Library, was struck from the indictment. 
despite the International Court of Justice finding Serb forces responsible. Worse, while the Srebrenica genocide prosecution was successful, the second charge of genocide against Karadzic for the horrors visited on the many Mus Bosnian Mus municipal municipalities, including Foča, Visegrad, Banja Luka, Prizidor, and Zvornik, where extensive destruction of monuments took place alongside killings, failed. The judges said that the prosecutors have failed to demonstrate in these places that Karadzic had the ne necessary intent to destroy the Muslim and Croat populations, so the genocide charge wasn't proven here. The outcome could have been very different if the cultural component of genocide was properly part of international law or simply the necessary evidence collected. Instead of the prosecution of attacks on culture being repeatedly given insufficient time and attention, under-resourced and treated, treated as standalone offences. Uh, back to Mostar Bridge. Uh, what, what, what's the alternative to copies masquerading as a genuine article um, and the problems all, that that brings? Um, I, I think that when the recreation or reassembly of structures does take place, the best approach is one of critical reconstruction, where the rebuilt place incorporates the scars of past conflict in line with the Venice Charter, and going back way before that, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings Manifesto. This would make a substantial difference to truth in the landscape. Uh, and this is the uh, Alta, uh, Alta Pitanakothek in uh, Munich. Um, it's an outstanding example of post-war reconstruction that does not seek to hide the ravages of war, but to incorporate them. Instead of installing new de decorative stonework to recreate the half-destroyed building exactly as it was pre-war, architect Hans Dilgast designed an elegant collage of brickwork, much of it retrieved from Munich bomb sites, to substitute in the gaps. It is beautifully done, an architectural kintsugi, the cracks in Japanese ceramics repaired in gold. And it com completes the composition without disrupt disrupting it. It is also truthful and authentic. The best architects are, have taken note of Dolgas critical reconstruction. For instance, David Chipperfield and conservation architect Julian Harrop's hugely successful collage reworking of the ones for Neuss Museum in Berlin. It's case in point. Even extending it with a new wing and a modernist colonnade inspired by but not aping the classical orders. Dolgas had to campaign hard for years to ensure this honest approach. And traditionalists have, have been in, since repeatedly push, pushing to undo it, undo it, to undo his critical reconstruction approach and reinstate the gallery's facades to pre war appearance. To return to Mostar and its bridge, as with Warsaw, there is absolutely the case to reconstruct heritage where it has been destroyed as part of an attempted genocide or ethnic cleansing. Even so, this would be a rarity. It, it, uh, and when it does happen, it should be critical reconstruction that retains evidence of its history, its destruction included, and firmly rejects unevidenced reconciliation myths or sleight of hand about historical authenticity. UNESCO needs to get its house in order. Evidence needs to be accurate. It needs to be authentic. Thank you. So are there any questions? Oh, yeah. Very much it was a oops, <laughs> very interesting uh how you describe, I guess, uh, authenticity as sort of a of a moving target, the conceptualization for UNESCO, right? But I'm just wondering how to get it entirely right. It's gonna be very difficult. Say so, sorry, say that last to, to get it entirely right yeah. in terms of reconstruction yeah. and, and looking at pre-war, there's gonna be a lot of yeah. debate and a lot of so how can UNESCO in practice really ensure that they would 
sort of respect this sort of how it was before and should it uh, and to what extent should also communities there be involved into how this is yeah. decided because if you if UNESCO says well it should be you know this way for all heritage yeah. around the world there may be different views like you were talking about Japan and the, the, the rich construction as part yeah. of a process and, and yeah. Nara etc so to what extent is it possible at the global level to come up with yeah. something that would be respectful also of a community's wishes in terms of reconstruction? I think that's an important point. There is a tension between establishing global standards that are stuck to and what local communities want. Um, uh, I think that those tensions can be resolved and they are resolved in places with interesting projects. Um, but we also need to think about uh, 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 even lo in local communities, are those post-war communities uh, in Mostar or what, who we'll see hopefully in eastern Ukraine when that territory is recovered? Are, are, you know, we, we probably won't have many ethnic Russians left. How, how are those decisions made? In, uh, in a post-war population, that might be very different from a pre-war population. Uh, how do you how do you adjudicate that? And it, I, I agree, it's it's not straightforward. But I think the first thing you do is ask the questions about it and, and be explicit that it's difficult and complex. Thank you so much. Completely fascinating. Um, I don't know if I have a question perfectly formed right now, but um, I just, I, I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking about the, uh, you know, the inherent kind of politicization of reconstruction as well. Um, and, you know, I, I love the kind of the critical reconstruction approach that, because I wanted to ask about, you know, that, but you, you came to it anyway. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I wanted to ask a little bit what you, I don't know, these processes, how, how you may navigate these processes of politicization that may sort of reinforce, uh, I yeah. don't know, diverging and yeah. uh, complicated memory politics and these kind of instances of sort of curating ruins to kind of communicate, you know, instances of victimhood, competing victimhood. And, you know, so I, I, I just was wondering yeah. what you thought about that. I mean, I, I know that complicated area and I try to explore that in, in this latest book um, and we'll hear more about that later today. Um, it's all political and we need to be explicit and open on that, about that as a starting point. Um, I think one of the key things to always think about uh, when looking at the framework for decision making and coming up with solutions is who are the gatekeepers what power do they have or what different power do the actors have um, and in whose interests are the gatekeepers operating? Um, and then what, 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 what I'm always loath to do is say there are consistent or, or universal solutions or methods because they need to adapt to the circumstance. But I think we can have principles uh, and and uh, I think uh, what I'm very keen is that we we stick to the evidence, uh, inc including material evidence, because if we you know w w the the evidence of history isn't just what's written in a book or found in an archive box; it's what, everything around us and how we read the city. Uh, uh, and when I say that, I sometimes get pushed back by historians who don't think say mon monuments are history so, for instance and I think we've been we need to be clear that the the, the, the fact that, you know the reality I think it's Hannah Arendt said something like uh, the reliability of our uh, world uh, rests partly on being able to trust the reality around us and that's still and in an era of fake news, post-truth, conspiracy theories, evidence and facts need to be the starting point for everything, I think. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you knew what is the exact percentage of the stones that were dived out by the Hungarian military divers? 
and include it into the new old bridge? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Sure, it's the short answer. <laughs> uh, because uh, when I was speaking to the locals, apparently the idea was that the Neretva has taken quite a bit of stone away with it, and it's somewhere in the Adriatic Sea. And apparently the stone that was being used was flown in from the island of Brac. Is oh, this yes, something that you know? Yes, most of, most of the stone is new, if not all. There may be some old stone incorporated into the body of the bridge, which is what happened at the Frauenkirche in Dresden. There is most of that was reduced to rubble. There was a sort of little side chapel that remains standing. And the rebuilders go to great lengths to say they rebuilt it using the old stone. What they've actually done is use the old stone as rubble within the interstitial space. And what you see is, is not old stone. It's a lie. Some of the, and um, and I think I think it matters that if you go to Mostar Bridge today, you know you're not seeing the old stones. It matters. Um, yeah, but the, the the percentage of old stone that was used, uh, I don't know. I know I know that river damage, water damage, meant prevented a lot of it being reused. So, Hi, Robert. Um, my concern really is the reception of the physicality. Well, Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. My concern really is the, the reception of the physicality of the monuments you're talking about. But the reception really is is perceived through the language we use. Sorry, can you so, speak up? I can't hear. The perception that we have of the physicality of the monuments that you've been describing. Um, you've referred to them as lies. Now, the buildings themselves are not lies. The way we express our perception of those buildings may be considered to be lies. But do you think that the language of that sort distorts the perception? I think the buildings are lies. I think they're telling us lies. And that's not just reconstructed buildings. It could be, I don't know, the statue of Clive of India outside the Foreign Office. That's telling us lies about the man and his record. Um, uh, or you, the White House masquerades as a historic building when 90% of it is actually mid-20th century. This, and I, I think these, these things do matter when you look at the work of something like forensic architecture or Robert Jan van Pelt, who gave evidence at the, at the Irving trial based on the materiality of the ruins at Auschwitz uh, and on the construction drawings and, and the, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, orders for materials. Those things tell, create a picture of the past. Um, and certainly, yes, I know that we will always bring different narratives to the facts about the past, but the facts should be reliable. And that's why I think authenticity is really important. Uh, people will always interpret it, interpret the facts in different ways. They will uh, uh, choose facts according to their purposes, but we need to ensure that the, the raw material of history uh, uh, is not uh, uh, adulterated. Thank you. Oh, is there somebody else? Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, so just uh, in, in my understanding, the, they don't actually know exactly how originally the bridge was built. No. Um, and uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, the, the kind of how is it possible to achieve authenticity even if one wanted to kind of recreate the techniques or technologies yeah. of the, the construction? And the other um, point I wanted to mention was uh, Sarajevo Roses. I don't yes. know if you... Yes. Sarajevo Roses. 
Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, yeah. with them. So they are, uh, for those of you who don't know, they are uh, kind of remnants of shells yeah. across the city, which are filled in with red paint. And uh, one might argue that that's kind of, you know, it's preserving um, 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 traces yeah. of the destruction. But many people in the city actually um, both resist being reminded of, yeah. um, as well as uh, kind of, yeah. you know, wanting uh, to rec recreate, recreate the past. Yeah. And they even feel it's disrespectful to walk on yeah. literally the, the points of um, um, wounding or killing yeah. of people. And uh, the last point uh, is about um, radical reconstruction, so um, yeah. Yeah. rather than critical, um, which was um, uh, brought into discussion by Lewis Woods. Uh, on examples by um, in in Sarajevo, originally Zagreb and then Sarajevo, another, um, and he argued that actually destruction um, is or should be used as an opportunity for radically new architecture, rather than recreating the past, which, as you've said yourself, can never be authentically yeah. recreated in the first place. Um, three things there. Uh, I, 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 I think no that that, that, that that those techniques were lost for the story must, and it's reprehensible if UNESCO pretends they have it is an exact copy because it's not. Um, you know this is this is the peak heritage body in the world telling untruths about what they've been doing, and and it's just. Shocking, um, and matters for the reasons I've, I've just outlined. But yes, the, the Sarajevo roses. I think people can get tired if if, if uh, uh, something's too if, if their environment's too didactic. Uh, but I think what happens over time is that we just forget. As Robert Musil said, there's nothing more invisible of than a monument. Our attention. It slips away from it like um, water drops on an oil cloth table, I think he said. And it's true until until the meaning of, say, Britain's imperial or colonial statues were pointed out to us, quite rightly, by activists. Most people not only didn't know who ha General or Havelock was or Clive of India or uh, uh, Others, <laughs> um, they, they not only didn't know who these people were, they didn't even look at the statues. And I think that comes with time and changed circumstances. Uh, to the point where, when decisions were being made about the reconstruction of, um, so I'm just conscious of time, uh, the reconstruction of uh, 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 um, the uh, Royal Palace in Berlin, you had commentators saying, we're sick of being told in Berlin about our duty to examine the past. And what you have had since reunification is a much diminished wish to, uh, uh, to pay attention to what happened in the past. And it's being erased in places like Potsdam and changes to the Neuwacke Memorial and all those kind of things. So that great period of experimentation in Germany in the 70s and 80s and 90s is now over, I think. Thank you. I'm going to have to move on, aren't I? Sorry. Thank you. And now we'll have um, Saida hassan -Aguj. So she's a proud Herzegovinian, don't mention Bosnia. And uh, she comes from Chaplin originally. And she's been talking to people about their perceptions. Some are local and some are some for the East Bank, some for the West Bank, some are international. So she's uh, going to tell us some of the things she's been discovering. Oh, is that yours? Yes. <laughs> you took yourself, yes. I will try not to know. Oh, 
So when Helen asked me, can you hear me? Yeah. When Helen asked me to contribute to this symposium, I duly accepted. Not because I consider myself a significant authority on the subject. I accept it because the destruction of the Starry Most has never left my memory. However, even on the 30th anniversary of the horrific destruction, watching the actual footage of the shelling is still rather painful. And it induces the same feelings of disbelief, pain, rage, and hatred was the perpetrators. To make matters worse, the commander who ordered the, its destruction was from my hometown, a small town some 30 kilometers south of Mostar, who was the Adriatic coast. Personally, I could never forget 9th of November, 1993. My parents, younger brother, and I had to flee during the Croat Bosnian War, or Croat Muslim War, as I like to call it. <clears throat> In the summer of 1993, we were fortunate to have a relative, my uncle Abdallah, who provided us with shelter and safety in Tripoli, Libya. That fateful day, the uncle came home from work, visibly distressed, white as a sheet and immediately turned on the television, selecting the Deutsche Welle channel. And there it was, the scenes of shelling of the Starry Most. Every single strike at the bridge felt like Harakiri. We were all crying in disbelief. How could they do it? The old bridge has survived numerous wars and occupying armies, but it had remained intact throughout the centuries. We have lost our friends, our home, and our land. Shortly before, my father was incarcerated by the HVO, or the Croatian Defense Council, as were the other male members of our family, in different concentration camps scattered around our hometown of Chapina and in the notorious Heliodrome in Mostar. Still, for some reason, the pain and horror of watching the destruction of the old bridge was unbearable. But it were unbearable, watch my grandma. Every strike at the bridge felt like a strike at our hearts, at the very core of our being. We understood then that this was a deliberate attempt to erase our past, our present, and our future. By our, I don't mean Muslim, I mean us who remained untainted by ultranationalism and its destructive rhetoric and actions. But this is my family story and our understanding of this great loss. What we could not comprehend is that in the aftermath of the shelling of Dubrovnik, how could the Croatian army and the HVO, Croatian Defense Council, commit such a heinous crime. We will never know. In a nutshell, the significance of the old bridge, its destruction and subsequent reconstruction and its importance today depends on individual background, education, as well as intellectual, social and political leanings. Personal opinions are often an extension of individual and familial wartime experiences and political views. I asked a childhood friend of mixed Christian ethnicity what he thought of the destruction. He himself had to flee to avoid the draft, but he saw it on the news like myself. He reported the feelings of utter shock, disbelief, sadness, and misery each time the old bridge was struck. As the shelling progressed, the feelings progressed to more negativity and utter disgust 
mixed with more disbelief, anger, and pure hate towards those responsible. Because you see, the old bridge was never a Muslim bridge. It was a pride and joy of Yugoslavia, and as such, it featured in all important cultural and tourism campaigns and brochures. Now, the question remains, and that is the question I wanted to get the answer to, is the old bridge joining and bringing the people of Mossad together, or is it dividing them? A couple of years ago, I found a YouTube clip recorded by a young Croat from West Mostar, who has never been to Stari Grad and to the left bank. His mission was simple. He wanted to cross the Stari Most and have a coffee, defying the advice of his family not to go to the other side. He was terrified, but he insisted on speaking in a Croatian dialect and refusing to hide his Catholic cross rosary necklace during his expedition. He was walking around in disbelief at the way in which he was greeted and treated in a polite and friendly manner in Starigrad. As he sat down in a cafe overlooking the study most, in panic, visibly anxious, he ordered his coffee and brandished his rosary. Nobody reacted to his language or to his jewelry. He was treated like any other customer. I was in Mostar only last week to find out what the destruction, what the destruction meant to the local population. The new old bridge, as it is referred now, stands proud, attracting, attracting tourists from the region and further afield all year round. Many know about his fate and are drawn to it before, because of its intriguing history. Its meaning, significance, and symbolism are ingrained in the local psyche. I have fond memories of the old bridge as a child, as I remember trying to cross it, trying to navigate my steps on its shiny and slippery stones, hoping not to fall over. The Mostarzi could easily identify a non-local and an out-of-towny by the way one would walk on it. While in Mostar, I had a coffee at the Marshall Bar and I chatted with its manager about his wartime experiences. He was saved by his father's his crowd friends in the nick of time. Otherwise, he also would have ended up in the heliodrome. We discussed the final ICTY decision to declare the destruction of the old bridge to justify military target and concurred the sheer idiocy of those presiding, with the notable exception of the Honorable Judge Fausto Poca. We agreed that the decision had reopened the old bleeding woods of injustice. I spoke with several family members and friends to get all ethnic groups involved in the conversation, as well as people working in Starigrad and around Starimost. I was advised to keep my conversations within the confines of the cobblestones in Starigrad as even a discussion could be problematic in the city and the country marred by divisive politics. One reason for this is the population displacement, as you Rob rightly pointed out. But for every per because every person that was expelled or left voluntarily from Mostar was replaced by someone else, more often than not, without any ties to the city. Why would someone care about the old stone structure if they don't have any emotional and historical ties to it? The other reason is the decentralized nature of the political structure and governance, where each canton in the federation is effectively a mini state, with two school curricula catering to two constitutive nations. In the case of the Herzegovska Neretanski canton, the Mostar canton, Croat and Bosniak. 
This has led to two parallel educational systems, meaning that two different versions of, of history are taught in one city. In other words, if an individual or, or, or an event for that matter was classed in one history class as criminal, it is likely that the same will be glorified as heroic in the other. I spoke with Irma, a proud Mostar woman who has never left, even during the worst offenses. She sums up views of the Mostar people proud of their heritage. These are her words. We are connected to the bridge like we are connected to life, to our heart. It hit our soul. It is a part of our soul. It is our novi study most, our new old bridge. Most that is one city, she insisted. There are people and non-people in the local parlance, which I love, ludi in nelud. Politics is divisive. People are not. We, meaning all ethnic groups, have always been friends, neighbors, and kumobi, a Balkan type of kinship akin to godparents and wedding witnesses before, during, and after the war. You see, our study most is our purpose, our defiance. You cannot destroy the old bridge. You will destroy every Mostarat. The study most being our purpose or our defiance is a sign that we exist. We have always had tolerance for each other. We have all celebrated all religious holidays together despite the communist political system. Mourning the study most is like mourning a child, a part of our soul. Whoever was most are born will feel the same. As she spoke about the destruction of the bridge, she talked about the red dust caused by the shelling and destruction. Her eyes welled up with tears, and so did mine. Afterwards, despite the mortar fire, everyone in the vicinity ran out to see what was left of the bridge. I am afraid that I have to disagree with Irma on one point. One does not have to be born in Monster to love the old bridge. The Stari Most and its surroundings have become a meeting place where, in the words of my cousin, who also survived the horrors of war, concentration camps, and displacement, because beautiful women are passing by, whoever is so inclined. You meet people now scattered all over the region and the world that you used to know, because everybody comes to the old town to have a stroll on the Stari Most. It symbolizes our inat obstanka. Again, in the local parlance, it is the spite or the stubbornness of our survival. There are purists who maintain that the new old bridge is not as beautiful and historically significant as the original one. And that may be true. The stone is not the same, the material used to rebuild it are not the same, neither is the craftsmanship, and the look is not identical. Certainly, walking across it is much easier. However, for us scattered around the world in a diasporic state, it stands as a testament of our origin, our belonging, and our identity. May it last forever. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much for sharing this uh, very personal uh, um, feelings and story and how you lived through that it was really, really interesting to hear. Um, I just perhaps would like you to extend a little bit on the very last point you made about this, because we had a whole presentation before about authenticity. Yeah. Uh, if I understand correctly, are people not that bothered about the fact that it's not authentic or are some people still kind of wishing it would have built 
differently or it doesn't really matter is the reconstruction more important um like every everything in mostar it really depends who you speak to okay so the staunch mostar born proud people who were born and and, and raised around the study most they will say yes it's ours it, it, it represents us it's our defiance it's our identity uh but if you speak to people who um have been a bit more hurt by the war and events, if, if they were displaced, if they physically have to leave. Uh, people who are really upset by the political events and the lack of progress and the divisive politics. Uh, if you speak to people who are more concerned about putting the food on the table and feeding their, feeding their families, they will say, well, it doesn't mean that much because really uh, what I really cared about is, is, is that old stone and, and the fact, you know, did Hairudin touch it with his own hands? Was it commissioned by this uh, Suleiman the Magnificent? It wasn't. It, it, uh, it could represent for some people the pain and the horror of what was done to them. Because as I said earlier, not many people went back to where they were expelled from. And that is rather painful. Uh, you, uh, Saida, you told me about uh, some interesting stories about international, i.e. British and Croatian, from Croatia visitors. Absolutely. Yeah, if you could recount those, because it's quite interesting that they actually came to see this reconstruction. Yes, absolutely. Knowing um, it was a reconstruction. Of course. Um, absolutely. Like, for instance, uh, the the bar manager of the, of the Marshall Bar, he said that uh, it has taken uh, a football game between, if I'm not mistaken, Hajduk, the split uh, football club, and Zrinski, the West Mostar club. And it is the leader of the Hajduk fans who convinced his, the people from West Mostar to come to Stadigrad and cross the old bridge. I took somebody from split to do it. Um, a dear friend of mine from childhood as well, a Croat lady whose uh, father's family is from all over in Croatia, um, um, uh, I think she has relatives in Međimurje, which is a northeastern part close to Slovenian border. She tells me that when her relatives come, they they have to come to, to study most. They have to have coffee and they have to buy souvenirs with Islamic insignia. So go figure. Yeah. Personally, I also have relatives from Zagreb, Catholic relatives. Uh, as we, we are all mixed, um, and they haven't been to Herzegovina, they haven't been home unless they have been to the Old Bridge and, and, and study grad. So I believe there is hope. Um, as I was uh, walking out of study grad, I bumped into a British couple who have been um, driving around uh, in that camper van all over the south, um, um, southwestern Balkans. And they've just crossed Durmitor from, from Montenegro. And they parked up and they came to study most. So I heard the accent and uh, I approached them, of course. And they said, uh, you know, where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. They're from Bristol. And, and the, the chap started to explain to me, to me where Bristol is. And I told him that I'm a Brit myself <laughs> now. And, you know, I said, like, why did you have to come here? You drove from Montenegro, you just parked up, and first thing you did was stand with your girlfriend by the old bridge and watch the sunset. And he said, it's the history and the sheer horror of the events, and we have to be here, we have to witness it. This is a question from our online audience. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I have previously read something about different groups having different geographic understanding. They think the bridge is the end of Mostar. And even if they know there is the other side of Mostar, uh, they won't cross the bridge as their ancestors had been. Can you share a bit? I'm not sure I, I, I understand uh, the, the, the question properly. Um, it seems like they're asking uh, that some people think that Mostar ends at either side of the bridge and they don't want to cross it. Yes, um, unfortunately, they are those views as well. As I said, it really depends of 
what your background is, what your education is, what your war experiences are as well. Um, as I mentioned in my talk and this video clip that I saw from a couple of years ago, I was, I was flabbergasted. The kid was 18 years old and he has never been to the other side. He was terrified and he was told not to come across it. At the same time, I do have some friends from childhood as well, Bosniak, Muslim, who, let's say last year, we were going to a festival in Mostar, and they said to me, I'm gonna only go across to the west side because of you, I don't go to that side. Is the anger, is the rage, is the injustice, and it's due to the divisive politics. Um, again, as Rob rightly pointed out as well, we do have two educational systems. You have Croatian school cu uh, curriculum, you have a Bosnian school curriculum. Our love for the bridge started with our history lessons. Our love of our heritage was given to us in our history lessons and visits. If you take that out of equation, what remains? So unfortunately, uh, unless we start having a more active dialogue between both sides, um, this, the situation won't improve. However, Again, it depends who you speak to. According to uh, this lady Irma I spoke to, she said that, that the youth will always find a way. Yes, the schools are separate and different. We are being taught different uh, versions of history, but the youth will always find a way to come together and to hang out and to pretty much enjoy life. But you know, which versions of history and which facts will be discussed, we are yet to see. So now we uh, will break for lunch, but afterwards, Nerma Kridge is going to be talking about uh, another site, a very important site in Mostar, that far from all the attention, uh, it, not far from the old bridge, but uh, which far from all the attention the old bridge and the old town have received has uh, ended up as a vandalized and rather neglected place. So she's going to be telling us more about the Partisan Memorial Cemetery and uh, designed by Bogdan Bogdanovich. So now uh, we have our lunch.
Uh, to show because I did the alphabet, so it combines the buildings and like the Cyrillic buildings. <laughs> the same one, but this one is inside the mosque, uh, the, the inside the um, pagoda. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I've lived here for longer than but my mom's yeah. So we're back now um, in Mostar, but to look at another uh, destroyed and attacked and increasingly vandalized historic site, uh, not very far from the old bridge, but not much attention has been paid to that. So Nerma Cridge is going to be telling us something about her, about the, how it was, con she's an architect and how it was, uh, uh, the, the intentions behind its design and also its, its state now. And then that will be followed by a film uh, that was uh, done in 2012, made in 2012 by the Institute of War and Peace record, uh, Reporting. Thank you very much, um, Helen, for um, inviting me to give this talk. Um, and... Um, Thank you to all the other speakers and participants for making this um, recollecting day, um, both very inspiring and very um, somehow optimistic. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Partisan um, Memorial um, and I've titled the talk um, with uh, a subtitle, Mostar's Wounded Bamboo. And the reason for this is because um, this memorial uh, is, uh, I think, wrongly or misperceived mis uh, um, by many, um, and also... Um, because it was conceived as a double or mirror image of a city, um, very much to reflect the city of the living. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, as the situation is now, uh, it's reflecting um, um, rather, I would say, true picture of divided city, um, which if you look at the bridge, at the famous bridge, uh, you wouldn't have a, a reason to understand. Um, and uh, uh, the reason why 
I called it wounded double. Um, and I was close to describing it as fatally wounded. Uh, but I guess um, I, we need to try and be more optimistic and um, uh, rather than um, uh, kind of somehow dispelling the, the end of the city. Um, so as all the speakers discussed before me, um, the bridge stood there for hundreds, um, 400 years, uh, and then it was destroyed in brief moment in history. Um, and then it was hastily rebuilt, um, not exactly as the original, um, and it's reinstated. Um, but in terms of connecting people, in terms of functioning as actually part of the um, uh, linking communities or linking activities in the city, it's actually doing the opposite. It's very much a divisive point. As uh, Saida mentioned, um, there are actually children and um, youth in, in Western Mostar who see it as the end of the city as the end of the, the city and never actually um, step on that. Most people, if they know anything about Mostar, they know about the bridge. After all, the city was given name after most, after the, the old bridge. Um, and most who know anything about the concrete um, monuments which were uh, built during former Yugoslavia um, in late 50s and 60s. Um, they know about Jasenovac and they know about Bogdan Bogdanovic, who was uh, an architect as well as um, a one time mayor of Belgrade and who died in exile in Vienna because um, his, his views of um, the brotherhood and unity were not accepted by the, the power, powers um, in Serbia. And uh, uh, so most would know this uh, famous Holocaust um, memorial in Jasino, it's in Croatia, uh, which has been refurbished and which is now um, sometimes described as concrete clickbait uh, because uh, people tend to look at these amazing images and then don't think anything further about the history or what they've done. And here we have an example of Andy Day who uses parkour to, um, uh, I, I would say, um, introduce new kind of youth, youth culture into these uh, monuments um, and give them, um, make them closer to the everyday and the international audience. So not far from the uh, old bridge uh, is a place which is wrongly called, uh, somewhat misleadingly called cemetery, uh, which is um, the, also designed by Bogdan Bogdanovic. And it's the last one in the cycle of the concrete monuments that he famously designed. Um, and uh, uh, these are some of the drawings that he used to describe some of the ideas that were uh, that were a part of this um, uh, part of his design. Um, and uh, what's interesting and I think very important is that um, uh, there was never any or very little, if anything, uh, ideological um, motifs or signs. And this was very much because former Yugoslavia was um, uh, kind of uh, tried to resist uh, Soviet um, empire. And uh, also part of that was uh, rejection of uh, socialist realism, which was the, the dominant architectural and art style in those times. 
so he um, actually uh, said how um, uh, when he created his designs, um, that they were saying, uh, you know, they, they were politicians were really encouraging him to do it as differently from the Soviet ones as possible, or the, 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 without any ideological, clearly kind of um, socialist signs like Red Star. And, and here we have um, city within a city, mirror image, a diagram. Um, it wasn't um, a cemetery, cemetery in a true sense. It was. It had small uh, number of um, uh, burial uh, remains, but the majority of it was actually designed for people from Mostar who died in World War II. And uh, there were uh, 700 stone plaques which comm commemorated their names. So it gave an opportunity to the whole city, the youth, and uh, those who were personally uh, involved to, to go there and to, um, to pay their respect. Um, and um, originally, uh, Bogdanovich also designed a small niche in which his uh, remains would be placed. Uh, however, uh, this did not happen for obvious reasons um, that we are going to see. Uh, so these are some of the early sketches of um, uh, the, the memorial wall. Uh, it's very um, important to note that uh, he uh, started working on it without actually knowing it was going to be more start because he was working on lots of different things. And then it took a long time to build it because of its colossal scale, but also because uh, the earthquake happened in Skopje. So all the resources and all the kind of construction materials and everything was directed towards resurrecting uh, Skopje in Macedonia. So the, the plans and the construction on this had to be stopped for a time. So uh, in scale and size, of it, um, it's really quite unique. It's quite, uh, it's so um, big that it's very difficult to take, uh, even with a sophisticated camera, it's very difficult to encompass its, its scale because it's also on a hill and it's um, now it's obstructed by plants and different elements. But even that wasn't enough. So the intention was also to have almost twice as much um, and to have a building which would be a museum, museum of the revolution and designed by an architect made in Georgia. Uh, and uh, um, the uh, completed uh, section in its prime, it had these, um, the, the kind of uh, uh, um, underneath the terraces were these um, uh, amazing uh, fountains which were filled with water and as they were kind of descending down the hill, they would actually create very interesting sound, uh, almost um, a, a musical um, composition. And it, it was used very much as a park. It wasn't used as a, a kind of a, just for serious uh, events, although it was used for that as well, but it was mainly used for park, for children, for youth to, to um, go there and to spend uh, uh, collective, collectively to spend time. Um, it was built partly by people of Mostar uh, through youth, um, kind of um, massive uh, youth uh, um, engagement. Um, and uh, what was interesting was because Mostar is um, like its name suggests, it's most of uh, many superlatives, uh, and uh, it's a, it's a still uh, the hottest uh, city in uh, former Yugoslavia. So due to the heat, most of the building actually happened at night uh, because they uh, um, they would um, uh, kind of that's the only time that they could during the summer that they could build it. Um, and not only that, but people were donating um, 
people were donating uh, stones, individual stones from their own houses. They were they would literally because there was shortage because of Skopje and because of generally uh, Yugoslavia was very kind of uh, in um, uh, uh, poor rec economic state. But they would literally take take the the stones from their own houses and and give it for the for the memorial uh, to be part of it. And uh, so it was very much. Um, uh, born from from the city, from um, uh, the opposite of um, top down, from uh, bottom up, as we might say, and it had also, uh, in addition to water, it also had these um, kind of landscape areas, and uh, it was used for um, uh, very much. Um, for a collective space uh, in in the best kind of um, uh, sense, and here we can see on the left you can see um, how it was in its prime. How the the stones uh, there were about seven hundred of them uh, were um, in kind of order, orderly fashion, but repeating the imperfection and the a slight asymmetry and the narrowness of the street, city streets and all the uh, literally kind of mi mi uh, mirroring it on a smaller scale. Um, and on the right, you can see uh, how it be became to be neglected and how it came to be uh, overgrown as well as uh, much worse than that. Um, and here is the sole example. This is the only example I could find of any kind of ideological um, signs uh, uh, on the on the memorial. And as you can see, it's just a flag and it's temporary, so it was never part of the original design. Uh, and this absence, I think, suggests something which is kind of transcends all, all these um, kind of ideological uh, divisions and. Um, and talks uh, more fundamentally about the city. Here you can see how it's difficult to kind of encompass due to its scale, but also the position on the hill and how it kind of stares back into Mostar and um, the old bridge in very distance. Um, and um, here, unfortunately, that, that's what um, Helen all, all already alluded to, but. Um, more and more, um, uh, we've seen uh, um, a regular um, uh, attempt uh, to destroy, physically destroy uh, this monument. And uh, uh, regularly when anti-fascist um, movement um, uh, uh, organized visits and tried to go, and go there to pay their respects, they have to be protected by police. And this is what happens. Uh, so it's not enough just to neglect it. It's uh, it also has to be uh, um, burnt. It also has to be crushed, literally. Uh, so they managed to bring um, a stone crushers in order to destroy physically destroy all these. Um, uh, individual plaques. Um, and uh, here, uh, I think it connects to some of the things that um, uh, I think Saida was saying. Uh, there's a graffiti that says, I am Ustasha, which was, uh, it's, a, it's a term for um, um, the Nazi, the army of the Nazi puppet state in uh, independent Croatia in Second World War. My father was communist, but I will kill him in the name of God. And unfortunately, these are the kind of um, graffiti that also happen regularly. And this is the kind of um, destruction that goes on. Um, and um, this is the graffiti. This is one of my 
my photographs and the graffiti that I found. Uh, so they still, even though there are no ideological, um, uh, there were no, uh, uh, all, all the different uh, names are very diverse. They belong to uh, all three nationalities. Um, and um, uh, even though um, there, there are no kind of official um, signs of um, uh, naming Tito or anything like that, but graffiti kind of invite back this um, um, horrific urge to destroy history and destroy everybody's history. Um, you can see here that um, uh, the, this one happens to be Bosnian um, Muslim name. Um, and uh, they were very, very diverse in terms of, uh, but because of its location, so it's in uh, Western um, part of the city, and also because uh, nobody, neither of the sides kind of uh, really want to continue this idea of uh, Yugoslavia or brotherhood and unity or connecting, uh, it's allowed and uh, to deteriorate and to to be destroyed in this way. Um, and these are some of the some more um, images that show um, the the. Uh, destruction, the damage, the weathering, and yet somehow this these uh, structures defy it all, and they um, they still um, are incredibly um, 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 graceful and incredibly um, uh, varied. Um, that it, it's. And if wherever you look, it's very hard to find uh, the same uh, motif because things um, uh, kind of continue to change and continue to, as though uh, the mirror, this city uh, in a city, this miniature is reading your mind and kind of um, uh, uh, inventing or uh, creating different forms and slightly uh, different ways of treating stone. Uh, this is the gate, uh, which obviously has no sign and it's got remains of the barns. Um, and these are the, the water is long gone. Uh, the, one of the suggestions of the Mossar politicians of the, from the Mossar mayor who happened, who is uh, Croatian, was uh, to actually to take the monument, to take all this into and put it into a museum in order to protect it. And then they would uh, presumably build a shopping mall and, uh, you know, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, this was a serious kind of, uh, this, this is the kind of discourse that, that is happening. Um, and um, in the meantime, uh, due to various factors, the uh, Partizan Memorial is um, kind of wounded, and I would say um, uh, it's very badly wounded, but um, hopefully not um, uh, not um, uh, killed um, altogether. Uh, here you can see the remnants of the um, fountain, and um, uh, apparently many of the children uh, actually learn to swim in this fountain because now it was, you know, uh, if you've ever been uh, to Mostar, is very cold and very um, dangerous river. So um, it had this real role in people's lives and um, which has now been taken away. And this is the one of the side entrances. So again, if you try to go there, um, you will be warned against, even by taxi drivers, by guides, by uh, people, they will say, it's dangerous. Do not go there and do not, and why do you want to go there? Go and see the bridge, you know, what's, uh, there's nothing to see there. Um, and, uh, and nobody will give you directions. So if you don't know where you're going, um, 
you can easily get lost and then you can potentially be, be dangerous just because uh, those uh, there are a few unfortunately people who will try and um, uh, um, deter you or maybe even um, and here I wanted to kind of uh, conclude with a more optimistic or positive way of kind of you know, and this is a, a project by a colleague of mine um, uh, who designed uh, um, an installation for Somerset House, which is where I think um, the society was originally used to be. Uh, and uh, I just uh, it kind of it um, resembled in somehow um, in some ways as this kind of fragmented mirror which reflects city, which is kind of badly damaged, divided, graffitied, and uh, 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 but then it somehow recreated yet again in our own stories, in our, in our own reflection. Um, and here is um, uh, an installation in 2013, uh, which has words by Bogdan Bogdanovich, uh, who said, um, and this was after he came to see um, uh, one of the last times that he came to see uh, the cemetery. Um, and uh, he, uh, he said how um, the, uh, he was given an honorary citizenship, citizenship of Mostar, and he even wanted to leave his own remains in, in uh, this uh, memorial. However, um, the situation that confronted him uh, in 2006, I think it was, um, uh, when he was already in exile in Vienna and uh, um, close to his own end, uh, he said, um, still we carry this immortal city within. I fear a city without memory, just as I fear people without self-consciousness, Polis, Metapolis, Megapolis, Necropolis. And uh, um, here are some more um, examples of uh, um, young artists and uh, people trying to engage with this monument and also uh, uh, bring in uh, kind of something that I think all of us who come from these parts can relate to. Uh, this uh, kind of that this what what is happening is not peace. This is not, and it's certainly not my peace. Um, and then uh, beautiful photographs of um, architects and artists like Anita Precha. Um, and then, um, and that's why I said there is a reason to be kind of more optimistic and more positive. Uh, there are people like uh, Sanada Namirovic Vidya, uh, who is the founder of the um, uh, uh, Urban House Idea and who tries to engage. And as you can see here, there's an image of the old, um, the, the old bridge, but it's very much part of the language, visual language of the youth. And, uh, and it's this eye which is staring back at us and staring back to this cemetery and saying why and uh, how can we change this? How can we bring this together? And this is one of also Idea's um, uh, um, uh, concept visuals, again, showing how, you know, what we actually need to do is not just gloss over and, you know, pretend everything is okay because the old bridge is rebuilt, but actually, we need to physically um, bring people and especially youth together and we need to give them jobs and education and reasons to stay in Mostar and not to see future and to, to uh, not to see future elsewhere. And this is one of the uh, examples of this kind of um, um, re um, kind of peace I guess, building through architecture, where it, and it's called Most Near, which means a bridge uh, of peace. Um, 
and it's uh, the, it's sited on one of the uh, concentration camps in in Bosnia from the recent conflict. And what they did uh, was they invited architects and uh, youth from across um, European Union and the UK, and they um, uh, created this project, which would be a community center. Uh, and literally built out of earth, out of ground earth, um, from the the area where so many people were uh, kept uh, kept captive or even killed. Um, and then um, this was a kind of reversed chronology. So this was before it was destroyed, unfortunately. But I I wanted to end on a more positive. And this was before, uh, just after it was restored. Um, uh, and then there was a beautiful commemoration to, um, uh, to the architecture, to the um, people of Mostar and uh, the actor and um, uh, poet Medrad Maximich, read poem by uh, Mat Isdar, which is called Message, Orca. And uh, 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 this, this poem is very long, uh, so I'm not going to read it here, uh, but it's extremely uh, beautiful, but it's also very prophetic because it talks about um, uh, this um, uh, person coming to kill him and then coming to uh, kind of, uh, and then wondering, coming back and wondering why is he still there? Why is he still on the, the why are we still in Mostar? Why are we still on the bridge? Um, and it seems like the the uh, this um, monument is uh, kind of frag fragmented and present all across um, the world um, in different ways. So there was a, a seminal exhibition in MoMA in New York in um, called Concrete. Utopia, but also just now there's a um, there's a um, 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 uh, an exhibition, a virtual exhibition, which uh, is um, inspired by um, two architects in um, uh, Vienna in the Architecture Center by uh, Melanie Hallhouse and Christoph Lambert. Um, and they, they actually witnessed um, the destruction that I uh, showed the images of, of the Partisan Cemetery in 22. And this was one of the reasons why they decided to create this. Uh, and they call it Stones Between the Fronts, um, because they were literally, these monuments are and still are um, in between the front lines. So they are uh, placed um, on the contest contested ground. Um, and uh, Bogdanovic was in exile in Vienna and died and was um, buried in Belgrade in Jewish cemetery. Uh, but his, uh, his uh, drawings, his collection, his archives are in Vienna. And that's also one of the reasons so to Go back to one of the points that uh, has been made before. I think virtual um, or intangible um, kind of heritage is uh, never enough on its own. It's never replacement. However, sometimes uh, that's that's all we can do, and ideally, it would be um, part of also recollecting. So you can see. Uh, also the drawings and the kind of conceptual ideas that weren't actually executed. Um, and uh, I just wanted to finish by thanking two people. I mean, there are too many people to thank. Uh, so thank you to Branka as well for being here, my uh, um, wonderful friend. Um, um, and uh, also to two people from Mostar. Sarah Julic, uh, who is uh, the president of the Anti-Fascist National Union, and he's uh, just been so incredibly generous and uh, um, incredible um, figure in many ways. He's also a theater director and uh, 
Um, and Senada de Miro Shabibia, uh, architect and chair of Mosa Idea, uh, who also um, bid out his knowledge and shared um, uh, experience and memories. Uh, this presentation wouldn't have been um, uh, nowhere near as um, uh, substantial. So thank you. Yep. Uh, I can take uh, some quick questions if you'd like. Nedma, do you know what are the latest efforts to undo the damage of the Partisan Cemetery? Uh, at the moment, it's uh, as I showed on some of the some of my uh, uh, photographs. So it's kind of in a state of. Um, uh, neglect rather than it's not uh, so the the kind of the more severe damage has been repaired uh, and I know that there are efforts uh, in terms of uh, both um, uh, Julich and uh, and uh, Habibia uh, they are trying to basically uh, get the the um, uh, uh, powers um, People in power, politicians, and that means the, uh, the mayor of Western Mostar, uh, to basically agree to have security, to have uh, uh, and to start the, the uh, process of repair. The problem uh, is somebody uh, at the beginning, somebody asked me, oh, is it a question of funds? Uh, the problem is not, is much more complex than just funds because the EU sponsored refurbishment in 2018. It was completely repaired and almost restored apart from the water. However, it was deliberately targeted and destroyed and the perpetrators haven't been caught uh, according to, depending on who, who you speak to, they, they everybody knows who they are. Uh, but there's no will to actually bring them to justice, and they're just dismissing it as, oh, it's just some youth, you know, uh, playing. They didn't mean it. They're not serious. Uh, and the problem is with security, and the problem is with the location. Um, and uh, I was even uh, kind of... Um, uh, toying with the idea in, when discussing because I think it's important to consider like um, we were discussing kind of how you reconstruct and sometimes the solution might be to actually move it elsewhere if that's the only way to so if it was in different parts of the city or even you know fragmented across the whole of the um, you know former territory um, maybe it would have been looked after better in fact, I'm I'm pretty sure it would have been, uh, but at the moment it's uh, it's I I I would agree with uh, Sarah Julich who says it will not not it, it's not going to be disappeared you know de destroyed completely, but then again that's what we were saying about the bridge, and then it was destroyed. And then, you know, the bridge, there was a political will and everything, and it did get rebuilt. However, for this, I'm not sure that there would be even enough political will for it to be rebuilt. Thank you so much. Um, so interesting. I was wondering about, um, you mentioned at the beginning sort of when you were talking about the history of the space and what it was kind of used for and the, it was a park and kids learned to swim and, you know, it was kind of a real place where different people or whoever, you know, it was just a, a social environment where, you know, there was contact between different people. And obviously now you're, you're you know, explaining that it's um, sort of in a state of neglect and maybe just disrepair to a certain extent. And I was wondering... Um, is the space still kind of used at all in any way? Do people like walk dog? I don't know, like do people go there much? Or maybe the fact that it's neglected is kind of reflecting that it's not it's not really in sort of as active use as much anymore. 
Yeah, I, I, I should have clarified a bit more. Uh, it's actually dangerous. So that's what I was suggesting when I was saying, you know, if you try and find it, then people will try and put you off. And that's because, unfortunately, drug addicts and uh, uh, different kind of uh, people gather there. So uh, you will not find children or family or anything like that playing there. You might find occasional tourists, uh, uh, but uh, it's very much, you know, um, it's surrounded by um, uh, neglect and uh, uh, wish to erase it, wish to, you know, because there are no signs, uh, there are no uh, uh, clear kind of, there's no security. So you literally kind of going there, um, not sure, you know, what's going to happen. And if there are organized, um, like official by the anti-fascist movement, for example, then they have to be accompanied by police because, again, there's a deliberate attempt to intimidate and to deter people from even knowing about it, even in, in this neglectful state. And it's such a ridiculous you know, situation because, obviously, it would have been you know, a great park for everybody um, and it, it could, yeah, which, which is what all cities need. Because all bridge is actually quite a small area, it's touristy, it's not used by everyday, you know, or ordinary people, even on the eastern side. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I visited the cemetery in 2012, and if I'm understanding you correctly, it's in much worse condition now than it was 10 years ago, you know? What's driving it, the destruction and the vandalism? I mean, what has happened in, what is it, just the last few years? It's it's political. Uh, it's a kind of to to complete the division and to complete the kind of sure. the political um, um, uh, process of um, basically dividing into um, Croatian and uh, Bosnian side, um, and well, um, uh, that's one of the things that um, uh, some of the uh, some of the people involved. Um, were uh, astonished when this the most recent destruction happened last year mm -hmm. and they were astonished because they were saying not even in the war you know it wasn't destroyed you know like this they they literally brought stone crushing machines right i what i'm yeah. curious about though i mean are they you know are we looking at you know local gangs or is it a more centralized movement? I mean, do you do you have an idea of, of uh, really well, where the yeah. the the destruction is is coming from? I think. I mean, I can understand to, the motivation, yeah, but it, it I'm interested back, in the in the organization of it. It goes back to what Sido was saying. You know, it depends who you ask. So if you officially, if you ask the most high mayor, he'll tell you, "Oh, it's isolated event. It's just some use." You know. They just kind of, you know, vandalized. Yeah. They didn't mean it. They're not really fascists. Um, and then, uh, and they were, they're underage. That, that was important. They were claiming that they're all too young to be even prosecuted. So what's the point in trying to find who it was? Whilst if you ask people like, say, Adjulic, he will tell you, we all know, of course, everybody is such a small place. Everybody knows who it is. And you know they they are. It's just that we are powerless. There's nothing, and so the uh, so practically, it's a small group of very young, you know, um, people, but they're supported by everybody else. That's like the question. The official, yeah. Yeah. And is that coming from within Mostar, or is is, it, within, it, what, is yeah. or a wider movement in the whole area or the whole country? It's yeah. It's part of the whole kind of Croatia, yeah, unfortunately.
Right. Yeah. Because I mean, these things, sure, young kids are are, are um, encouraged to go and cause damage, and they, they you know they think it's fun usually, but it's, but I mean, it's very rare that that the ideas are coming from the young children. Exactly. So, I mean, that's the you know yeah. is is really what you know ultimate where is you know. Are they political movements or are they the criminal gangs or? Yeah, they are. Uh, I mean, it's combination, but also football hooligans. And football hooligans. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So it's a combination, but uh, also it's it's all kind of stemming from the uh, independent um, Nazi puppet state mm -hmm. um, during the World War Two to what to which certain sections of um, Croatian um, population still are trying to kind of, um, and uh, uh, they don't have, as you might know, uh, they do not agreement gave Serbia separate entity, but there's no separate entity for Croatia, for Croatian. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. in Bosnia. But they're but they're destroying part of their own section of the city, though. They're destroying, but the way they see it, it's uh, you know, so they could rebuild or build something that right. they, you know, that should be. That they want more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we have a, a film of the um, that was first produced, uh, made in 2012 by the Institute of War and Peace Re uh, Reporting. And we have Daniela Pellet here from there, the managing editor, and she's going to just briefly introduce the film. I think it's yeah. well. Hi, uh, hello, uh, I am. Daniela Pellet, the managing editor of the Institute for and Peace Reporting. So we are a media NGO that started our work in, in the Balkan Wars of the 90s um, with the idea that um, supporting people to tell their own story and report fairly uh, helps um, in turn support human rights uh, and democracy. We now work in about 30 countries around the world. Um, Bosnia remains very close to my heart, though. For many years, I covered proceedings at the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, I covered many of the trials, including that of the army commander, commander-in-chief Ratko Mladic, and the Bosnian Serb president, um, Radovan Karadic. Uh, it's interesting to note that cultural destruction uh, did not form the focus of any of those um, uh, trials, but it made up uh, a significant part of some of the individual cases and has, uh, so that experience helped form uh, some important uh, jurisprudence for future prosecutions of cultural destruction as war crimes, which is very relevant now to the work that ID IWPR has gone on to do in contexts like Syria and in Ukraine. So this film uh, is part of a series of films I worked on, wasn't me, um, uh, to mark uh, 20 years since the uh, beginning of the war in Bosnia. It's look, they look, the series, I, I recommend you uh, visit our website to, uh, to see more. They, they take in a number of uh, issues and consequences, uh, some of them happy and positive of people working together and reconciliation, but some, uh, as in this particular film, um, much less positive. The, the film is 11 years old, but as Nerma said, very little has changed. The situation has only got worse, but I think it's a, a very interesting watch. Um, the more eagle-eyed amongst you may note a typo in the subtitles for which I take full responsibility. I don't know what happened. <laughs>
up there. I'm going to notice what they're doing. Hopeful. <laughs> Just trying to find it. We don't know what's happened here. Something strange. I should just say whether getting bringing back the video is um that actually the um the the cemetery was declared an endangered heritage uh, site for in in Europe for by Europa Nostra this year mainly due to the efforts of Senada Demirovic and Idea and uh, though I'm not sure that actually brings any money but perhaps some attention.
It is on the IWCA. Oh, there you go. Get used to this. Seems to just stop. Oh, there we go. That's it. Mi se nalazimo u Mostaru na jednom mjestu koje je obdržavalo jedno vrijeme, partizansko spomen groblje, koje je u stvari jedan kulturni spomenik Bosne i Hercegovine gdje obilježava jednu epohu jednog vremenskog perioda i ovdje nema sahranjeni ljudi, ali se ipak naziva partizansko spomen obilježen. To je partizansko spomen groblje, jer to nije običan spomenik. Tu su i posmrtni ostaci jednog velikog broja poginuli partizana. Ja sam se podstaro se usvojio i u 85. godini. Vršim dužnost predsjednika odbora za obnog partizanskog spomen groblja i podizanja spomen obilježja žrtvama fašičkog terora. Mostar je u toku drugog svjetskog rata dao ogromne žrtve i doprinio samim time u borbi protiv fašizma. Ja ovdje imam tašno imena po imenično za koje se je moglo utvrditi da su to ti ljudi. Spomen ploče su postavljene sa imenom, prezimenom, mjestom rođenja i godinom smrti i mjesta smrti. Tu se nalazi negdje oko blizu 800 partizana je obilježeno. Nažalost, negdje oko 200 i nešto se nalazi u zajedničkoj grobnici tamo gdje se polažu vijenci, to su posmrtni ostaci partizana koje su stradali uglavnom u Četničkom puču, kada su Četnici izvršili izdaju i pobili jedan veliki broj po nalogu Draže Mihajlovića i zato začuđuje odluka koju je donijela opština da se taj spomenik uništi i pretvori u ljetnu pozornicu. Ovo je radilo javno preduzeće za obnovu i izgradnju Mostara, ovu studiju, to je čitava studija, ima i svoje projekte, ali možda da vam pročitam samo jednu rečenicu iz ovoga programa. Pošto gornji dio objekta može funkcionirati i kao scena sa formiranom scenografijom za multimedijalne projekte, performanse i suvremene teatrijske izredbe, Mogu li je preostale kamene ploče sa urezanim imenima ukloniti te i deponirati, a terasu potraviti? Neću da vam čitam sve ovo ostalo. Mislim da ova rečenica najjasnije govori šta je bila želja. Kad smo mi saznali i Savjez antifašista i Boraca Nora, 
Normalno je da smo mi na sva vrata i na sva zona zazvonili, kako kod međunarodnih predstavnika, tako i gradskih vlasti, da je to sramota, da je to jedan civilizacijski postupak i odnos prema poginulim, pogotovo borcima protiv fašizma, da su oni tu sahranjeni. E onda su oni povukli tu odluku jer je veliki bio pritisak na gradske vlasti da se ta odluka ne sprovedi. Onaj ko pamti ovaj spomenik iz onih vremena, najljepši kad je on tek otvoren i kada je bio, rekao bi, jedan od ponosa grada, da se ne može osjećati nikakvu ugodnu. Mislim da je to jedina istina. Prvo miniranje u gradu Mostaru koje je izvršeno, izvršeno je 11. marta. 1992. godine na partizanskom spomeniku. Sva ta vlast koja je došla ovdje, pogotovo iz ovih stranaka koje nose, daj da kažem, hrvatski nekakav naziv, došla je na krivima ustaške emigracije. Ja sam svojim očima gledao te pripadnike HOS-a koji su nosili ustaške oznake kakve su bile za vrijeme takozvane nezavisne države Hrvatske za vrijeme Pavelića. Sami miniranjem nisu bila velika oštećenja. Zna se ime i tačno odakle se minirano, odakle je uzet eksploziv, zna se tačno ko je izvršio to miniranje koji je se hvalio time. Ali ta oštećenja su nastala kasnije namjernim uništenjem. dvijeljedite godine formiran je odbor za obnovu partizanskog spomenika. I mi smo uspjeli, zahvaljujući donacijama Norveške, Holandije, sredstvima Ministarstva za kulturu Republike i nešto grada, mi smo obnovili taj spomenik. Posle te obnove, spomenik je u toj mjeri oštećen, daleko većoj mjeri nego što je bio posle završetka rata. Što se tiče ovog mjesta i devastiranja, ono je prisutno od samog završetka rata, znači od sami ratni djelovanja pa na ovamu. Na dosta mogućih i nemogućih načina se devastira. Jedno veće se je uputila grupa, ajde da kažem, huligana sa motkama i nekakvim batovima prema partizanskom spomenu grobu. To je bila skupina jedna građana koja je htjela na na neki način da se ovo devastira, da bi vjerojatno s namjerom su priče iz kulara, znači sa ulica, u namjeri da se ovo groblje izmisli odavde, odnosno spomen obilježi. Samim tim uništavanjem ovog spomenika dođenjem u neko stanje nepopravljivosti. Moram ovaj put da pohvalim policiju. Vrlo brzo je intervencala i spriječila je tu grupu da ne izvrši uništenje ili oštećenje toga spomenika. Nijedan objekat, nijedna ulica ili bilo koja druga institucija ne nosi naziv tih 1600, blizu 1700 žrtva fašičkog terora u periodu 1941-1945. godine. A u isto vrijeme u ovom gradu pojedine ulice nose nazive njihovih krvnika. Kakav je bio Mile Buda, kakav je bio general Francetić, Florković, da i ne nabraja, koji su posluđeni kao najveći zločinci fašisti u toku drugog svjetskog rata. U Mostaru, gradu, vrlo često novinari kažu da živi fašizam. Ja odgovorno tvrdim da to nije istina. Da se samo određene stvari žele konotirati u tom pravcu i to apsolutno ne stoji za grad Mostar. Moramo, kažem, razšlaniti šta je to borba protiv fašizma, moramo razšlaniti šta su zlodjela u toj borbi. Jer svaki rat pokazuje ružne strane i svaka vojska ima trenutaka kada je pravila zlodjela, a ta zlodjela treba uvijek ocijeniti negativnim i treba ju suditi. 
ponovo se pristupilo uređenju spomen groblja i uloženo je prije dvije godine su završeni radovi 500 hiljada maratona i tražili smo da se uspostavi stravarska služba video nadzor rasvjeta međutim pošto do danas nisu postavljeni spomenike ponovo dovede malte ne u prvo bitno stanje i oko 500 hiljada maraka bačeno je uvodno Nema svjedoka, u tome je stvar, što nikad nema svjedoka, već je nakon, znači poslije devastacije, poslije devastacije drugi, treći ili pet ili čak i mjesec dana, nama dođe informacija da je devastirano grob. Nije bilo o, o, podnošenja nikakvih prijava ili da je pronađen počinjac. Ja prije svega želim pokazati kroz rad gradskog vijeća i sve one stenograme da uzmu ljudi i moja nastojanja da se ovo obnovi i moje odlasci u Beć kod živućeg autora i naši dogovori, sve je bilo u tom pravcu da se ovaj spomenik ovaj prije svega rekonstruira, da se dovede u onaj sjaj koji je nekad bio. Moja želja bila da bude i ljepši nego je bio i na kraju krajeva sve te što smo mi stvari napravili kroz projektnu dokumentaciju, autor dok je bio živ, složio se i potpisao. Bogdan Bogdanović. Mnogi u Mostaru još uvijek ne znaju da je to prije svega vrhunski atekta, odnosno umjetnik. Da je sveučilišnik profesor, da je akademik, da je bio gradonačelnik Beorada, da je iz dobro poznati razloga i napustio Beorad, dakle čovjek demokrata. Dakle, govorimo o čovjeku koji je bio evropskog ranga spomeničke umjetnosti. Vi znate da je taj spomenik proglažen nacionalnim spomenikom Bosni i Hercegovini. Ja mislim da se niko ne može odreći svoje istorije. Jer postoje pamćenja, postoje određeni zapisi u vidu knjiga, u vidu filmova ili na drugi način. Prema tome, onaj ko pokušava taj nije čovjek i takav odnos nije civilizacijski. So thank you very much. And um, I think there's been a lot to think about in all these presentations and uh, and I'm sure there's much to discuss, but thank you for all attending. <laughs>